Welcome to a sparkling new podcast from Mike Parry and Mike Graham. We're the two Mikes. Actually, it sounds even better when you do it Dullsville, because when you try to be happy and excited and energetic, you sound pathetic. Thanks. I didn't just go red, my face exploded. When I got on the plane to go home, they almost wouldn't let me on, because I looked like Elephant Man. I'm Mike Graham, he's Mike Parry. You're listening to the two mics on TalkSport. Andy Murray's got his usual preparation for Wimbledon sorted out by getting dumped out of the Queen's uh, tournament by an unknown Australian. Ranked 90 in the world, Jordan Thompson couldn't believe his luck. Meanwhile, Andy says he's sorry he won't be playing any more games before Wimbledon. What sort of behaviour is this from the number one tennis player in the world? Meanwhile, there's a dearth of managers in the football business. Crystal Palace and Southampton are still rudderless and Sunderland haven't got anyone running the place uh, either. Is there any point in having managers at these clubs? 087172233. Double four. Also coming up on the show, it's Porky Vision Day as well. The best TV review this side of the Black Sea. You won't want to miss it. You're listening to The Two Mics with me, Mike Graham, and Mike Barry on TalkSport. This is Talk Sport. We are the two Mikes, and I'm delighted to say it's time to say a very, very good morning, uh, not for the first time, to Mr. Mike, a Porky, a Parry. Very good morning to you, Mr. Parry. Yeah, well, a very good morning to you, Mike. You've been here for hours, haven't you? Uh, uh, well, not really, no. I uh, I was uh, very happy to uh, review the papers on, really? the, on the breakfast show with yeah. Al and uh, Ray, who were down at Ascot. I mean, you're not on the radio enough. I mean, why do you have to come in and do the papers? No, I did it out of a request. They asked me to come and do it. They said, really? it's a big day, it's a powerful day. We need somebody who knows what he's talking about. They couldn't well, find they anybody. Couldn't find anyone. <laughs> <laughs> invited me. Um, anyway, He's listen. not going to start killing off all my best lines. No, though, no, I'm not, no. Now, uh, listen, um, I'm very serious here about what I'm going to say, OK? Really? OK. I, I am absolutely disgusted with mm. a, a lot of people in this nation who are now cl- uh, climbing on Andy Murray's back because of his, um, his exit from Queen's. Well, in... it's ridiculous. Yeah, but it's not ridiculous. Did you watch the game? I watched the game yesterday, right? And his, his timing yeah. was off. Yeah. His shot uh, making was off. His serve was off. Everything yeah. was off. Okay. You know, and he, deser- he deserves to be doing better than that. Mm. He deserves, uh, his fans deserve better yes. than that. You know, this guy should come to tournaments better prepared. Okay. I don't care that he's just become a new parent. I don't care that mm. he's number one in the mm. world. Mm. You know, he's let everybody down, and I think it's an absolute disgrace. Well, I think you're a disgrace for saying it like that. Have you had the same opinion about Rory McIlroy since Rory last McElroy? weekend? Well, Rory McIlroy was not the world's number one golfer, never has been, uh, who, for more than about, you know, two weeks. Oh, come off it. He, was, he's, he has been the number one golfer yeah, on but for two a very separate short, occasions. For no, a very no, short no. period of time. No, for months at a time. No, nah, not really. And he, go, he goes to... Uh, Rory McIlroy has never dominated golf in the way that Andy Murray has dominated tennis, right? Well, Rory McIlroy's not as old as uh, Andy Murray yet. He's well, that's about, true. He's got that three or four I mean, years I on I mean, him. I would not put any faith in Rory McIlroy retaining or getting back to being number one yeah. at golf because he's not committed enough. Well, I'm sorry, but I... He's more interested in making money. But you see, you're just... You're just floundering around no, now. I said, did you feel the same way about Rory McIlroy disappointing no. the nation no. by going out I said, no. halfway through the US Open? I, I said, damn no. disgrace. Rory McIlroy is one of many people. I mm. mean, we saw Mr Fleetwood, did we not? Your yes. new pal, uh, who you're going to try and invite up to Everton over the course of the next season. Because rock on, he's Tommy. Rock on, Tommy. I mean, there's plenty mm. of British uh, golfers who you can yeah. cheer on, right? Yeah. There aren't pl- plenty of British tennis players you can cheer on. There's only one. There's only ever been right. one. Okay. And Andy Murray has been at the pinnacle mm. of his game mm. now for about, what, 10, 15 years, yeah. and to, to, to appear at a tournament mm. it, just before Wimbledon, mm. which is the crown uh, of the year, as far as British tennis fans are well, concerned. It's, it's the gem in the in the tennis calendar. Yeah, it's, it's mm. the jewel in the crown, if you like. But yeah. the point is to, to appear before that tournament, mm. like two weeks before that tournament, mm. to play in Queens. And by the way, he only ever wins Wimbledon when he's won Queens, right? Yeah. To be so unprepared... Well, he's only won Wimbledon twice. He yeah. just happened to win oh, Queens sorry. on, on, on the two Only won Wimbledon twice. He Wimbledon won... is a massive event. Of course it is. For him to win that is tremendous. Yeah. Right? right, he's not going to win it this year. Of course, because he's he can. not mentally right. Of course, he can, and he's a disgrace for not now, being properly prepared. Now, first of all, I want to point out some things that I've said about the tennis situation and uh, and Andy Murray, and then I will tell you who's responsible. Yeah, go on. Andy Murray is in fact Sir Andy Murray. Sir Andy Murray. I told the establishment, do not give Andy Murray a knighthood while he's still playing. It'll be an unbearable pressure upon him. It will completely change the way he thinks, the yeah. way he trains, the way he acts, his responsibilities, and they ignored me. So I'm putting well, firmly... why wouldn't they ignore you? I'm putting firmly does. in the dock the man responsible for Andy Murray's oh, collapsing yeah. oh, form... There we go. Yeah, is, who's fault is it? David Cameron. 
What do you love her? Because David. you hate David Cameron. I do not hate you David hate Cameron. David Cameron. You've not. got a pathological no. hatred of the man, I... which is which is uh, over and ab- way no. over and above any no. kind of uh, logic. Not at all. Now, when Andy Murray, you blame David Cameron for taking us out of Europe. You blame David yeah. Cameron for wrecking the economy. Yes. You blame David Cameron for going into Libya. Yes. You blame and destroying David Cameron half of for destroying Africa. the the uh, the yeah. whole kind of you know social structure of this country. Yes. You're absolutely obsessed with the man. No, David Cameron was the prime minister when Andy Murray won his second. Wimbledon, OK? Yeah. The minute that happened, that triggered a let's give Andy a knighthood. Now, Mr Cameron's powers of leadership should have been no, 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 he's too young to put too much pressure on him. No, no, no. You know well, what? hang on, we give you knighthoods know? to all sorts of people. Of course we do, because prime ministers like to sort of associate themselves with winners. That The, the first time Mind it you, ever happened... You may have some of you, because Bradley yeah. Wiggins got a knighthood and look what happened to him. Uh, exactly. Now, the first time it ever happened, when the new Blair government came in, in 97, OK? Yeah, right. Alistair Campbell, mm. you know, who was head of... Um, There's another guy you hate. I, no, I don't necessarily hate Yes, you do. Alistair you hate Campbell. Alistair Campbell. Alistair Campbell used to be an old friend, so, you know, don't yeah. worry. But, but you any, hate him anyway, for giving up the he, he was head of uh, government information services or something. His first bright idea to get the population on side was to uh, recommend uh, Jeff Hurst for a knighthood yes. as the only man who's ever scored a, so a, Jeff Hurst. a, a hat-trick in, the, in right. the World Cup final. Well, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it, but what I would have done is I'd have knighted every other member of the 1966 well, you England can't team. Knight the whole team. Well, I, th- I think Why? it's I think it's elitist Rubbish. to say only Jeff Hurst did That's anything ridiculous. on the day. Well, Alan Paul Hurst... was the best player on the oh, day. Don't be so Alan Paul was man of the match, no. and he should have got a knight as well. You can take your Everton shirt off now no. and actually start talking sense. And, anyway. So Jeff Hurst scored the hat trick that won the game. And who, right? who provided the crosses? It Alan matter. Ball. No, he didn't. Right now, Martin then. Peters uh, provided a couple of them. Uh, if you don't mind uh, uh, me reminding you of that. Well, the controversial goal was Alan Ball. Now, if you just calm down for a minute, please. I'm perfectly. Calm. I'm telling you my logic. So, yeah, go on. so, uh, so David Cameron scurries back to um, to Downing Street well, from did, Wimbledon. Did Alistair Campbell not give Sir Alex Ferguson his knighthood as well? He did. Yeah. He did. Well, are you going to complain about that now? No, I'm not going to complain about that, but it's populism, you see. Well, in fact, in the stadium, the new camp, Alistair Campbell worked his way down to the yeah. dressing room area and was mm. shouting over a horde of media people, Alex! What about a knighthood? Yeah. Will you take a knighthood? Because yeah. he had to know that he'd take it first, because, yes, of course, yes. he's a working-class yeah, hero. Right. And he said, yeah, I'll be very nice. Thanks, Ali. And that's how that happened. Really? So so they give these baubles out, you see, to try and enhance their own I position. I don't know why you're making excuses for Andy Murray on the grounds no. that he was given a knighthood. No. The guy it was is, unprepared mentally. Fault. He was unprepared physically. He played yesterday like a guy who hadn't had a game of tennis for about three months. Mm. Everything he hit was long. Everything he hit was out. Mm. He put things into the net that he would normally yeah. have made. Yeah. He was beaten by the world. World's number 90 ranked player. Yes. Don't ever forget that, right? It can happen. The guy, the guy, no, it cannot happen. He's supposed to be the world's number one tennis player. What? He should play no, like no it. No other great tennis player has ever been humbled and, uh, and knocked way. out of a tournament by... In two straight sets. By a greenhorn. In two right? straight sets, right? Yeah, well, How about this from Johnny? Well, they only played three sets. It's so the best of three, actually. Yeah, exactly. That's the what be- I'm you don't understand anything about tennis. Of course I uh, do. Here's what Johnny says. I completely agree with MG. Mm. Andy Murray is the world's number one. He should play like it. That's my argument. You see, he should see, play like he's the world's number one you, player. You've built this tidal wave of uh, resentment no, and, and, and dislike, almost true. bordering on hatred against no. Andy Murray. I don't hate Andy Murray. I just want him to play like the world's number one tennis player. I'm telling you, he should never have been I'm made Sir you. Andy Murray. I'm telling you, Jimmy. <laughs> uh, he should never have been made uh, a knight, and that's down to David Cameron. David Cameron failed at almost everything he did while he was Prime Minister, and this is another legacy of his total failure. But on this occasion, it's impounded on Andy Murray, who was a great... Great guy who is a national hero. No, he's not. Who is a man of great no, character. Not. Who's no. given this prize Incorrect. money to the? Yeah, the... I'm sure they're really grateful. He gave him eleven grand. Well, you that, know, you could have given them that. That is mean mouthed. I bet no. you. I bet you. He's given them eleven thousand. He will give them. Well, I hope he does. To... He should give them the rest of the money he would have won if he'd actually won the tournament. I bet you he will. Well, he should I, do. That's the sort of guy he is. That's what he should do. He, he, he's a great hero. He's a great winner. We should all be proud of him. The fact that he goes out of one tournament and you're no. making a huge crisis it's of it. It's not one tournament. It's not his this fault. This is one tournament that he needs to win in order to win Wimbledon. I want to hear from you fans out there because no, I know No, he doesn't need to win agree. this to win Wimbledon. Well, he's he never could... won Wimbledon without winning Queen's. But he's won Wimbledon twice, yeah, man. Yeah, but his, every in, single time in he's won it... the 13 times he's entered The it, two he's times that he's won it, yeah. he won Queen's beforehand, right. which proves something to you, right? I think he's he already could... said today, hmm. oh, I hope I have a bit more practice, you know. Yeah. You know, he wants he needs to, he needs to play more why did, tennis. Why did you put that in a mocking sort of, because you know, he sounds thick like thick Scottish type... Because that's, uh, what he sa- because that's what he sounds like. No, he doesn't. Yes, no. he does. I, I, I want to give out the number. 08717 22 Lots of people getting on your back saying, you plank, Porky... 
David Cameron was not the Prime Minister when Andy Murray was awarded a knighthood in the New Year's Honours. No, he wasn't, but he instigated the movement to make him a knighthood. Would you you like to give the number out while you're here? Yeah, Mr Cameron then went out of power, Mrs May came in, she was officially Prime Minister, but Mr Cameron initiated it. So get your facts right if you want to criticise me. Give me a call, please, because I believe... No, it's not you they're giving a call to, it's TalkSport. Give TalkSport a call and I will give you now the number, OK? Go on, give it It out. It is 087... (laughs) <laughs> Could you just shut up for a minute, you, you <laughs> oaf? Right, it is 08717 yeah. right. double two double three double four. Is that it? That's it. Thank you very much. This is Talk Sport. Simon says this on Twitter. What was Andy Murray's excuse this time for the loss? The heat, mm. an injury, or the Porky Jinx? It's a very good question, that, because, of course, ever since uh, Andy yeah. Murray got knighted, uh, Porky's been saying that, uh, you know, he is now going to be um, putting fear uh, yes. into the people in the other, in the other dressing rooms and uh, because he is knighted and he is Sir Andy Murray. Yes. People won't want to play against him. Yeah, in well, fact, it's been the complete opposite. Well, I'll tell you, there's a few messages here which you're going to uh, have to listen to. Mr. Graham, oh, yeah. have you ever had a bad day? No. Andy Murray's just had a bad day, but it's part of Rubbish. life. Ken the Spurs fan. Another one here. Mike Parry's a force of nature, not like low face. MG is low face. Give Porky a knighthood. Well, you see, that says it all, doesn't it? Yeah. People look at You'd us. love a knighthood, wouldn't you? Um, you I've, would. I've never considered you it. You would love a knighthood. I, I, no. Every year, you, your little what? face has that disappointed look about it because no. you're not on the, on the New no, Year's no. Honours list. No, no, not at all. Let's talk to a man who knows an awful lot about it. Pete Cohen uh, is one of the premier minds when it comes to sports psychology, right? He certainly he is. He is, in many ways, probably the best person mm. to tell us about why Absolutely. Andy Murray is incapable of winning Queens and not even, no, not winning Queens, but. Uh, going out so early yeah. that, in fact, this is going to affect his Wimbledon performance as well. Yes. Pete, a very good uh, morning to you. Welcome. Thank you very much to the two mics. How are you both? Yeah, yeah. very well indeed. Thanks. Very well uh, great, indeed. Great to have you back on now, the show, Now, Porky Pete. doesn't Thank know you. much about tennis, I'm afraid, so uh, we'll have to try and talk in broad oh, terms. That'd be so ridiculous. But basically, uh, a lot of people agree with me that Andy Murray, who is supposedly the number one tennis player in the world, should play like the number one tennis player in the world. And it's all very well saying he's had a bad day at the office, but he only ever wins Wimbledon when he's won Queens. Don't you think this is a disgraceful performance? Well, uh, I'm not going to slander him, but I, what I will say is that something really weird happens sometimes where people reach their goal. I don't know whether his goal was to win a major championship or to be world number one, hmm. but this seems to happen a lot. When, when teams or individuals win something that they set their, their hearts and minds to, they then find it really hard to set goals. It's almost like there's a part of their brain that shuts down. Yes. But you can see this happen with teams. They have an England rugby team. It's happened with the England cricket team. It's happened with many people, individuals. Who, I remember Vijay Singh, you know, he became yeah. that world number one. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, you just kind of disappear from, from, from your yeah. previous form. It happens, it, with, it, it, it happens with boxers okay. a lot, Pete, because they, they have to work so hard to get to the peak of fitness. And once they've achieved a title, they think, God, is it worth getting out of bed at four in the morning? Yeah, I mean, if you look at, I mean, the, probably the best team of all time, you know, New Zealand rugby team, 82% win ratio. For them, when you play for New Zealand, it's it's not about playing for New Zealand. It's about leaving the team when you finally stop playing in a better place than you left it in. So people have always got a goal that's kind of ahead of themselves. It is, mm. from my experience, for a lot of athletes and teams I've worked with, it is quite tough to get people remotivated when they've achieved something which they never thought they could achieve. Andy Murray, in an interview mm. recently, said he only thought he was going to play for a couple more years. And yeah. the fact that he never thought that he was going to win you know, two majors, let alone three majors. So Mm. who knows what's going through his mind, but I suppose it can be quite tough to get yourself inspired again once you've achieved more than you ever thought you would. Well, well, it may be, but that's what a winner does. That's what a number one winner does do, Pete. You're now making my argument for me. He comes back in. Yeah, hang on, I am. But then I'm saying, within all that, of course, Pete, everybody can have an off day. And why is Andy Murray being lambasted and barracked as a loser? Because he lost one game of tennis. Well, I think that's part of the society that we live in. You know, we love to bring people, pull, pull them up when they do something well and find any opportunity to kind of have a go at someone when they haven't performed, you know, the way that maybe we all expect them to. So mm. look, there's always two sides to an argument. That's why you've got two mics, right? So you well, one, of the, one of the reasons... Things. Well, Pete, that's a very, very well-pointed-out fact. One of the mm. reasons that I get so irritated with Andy Murray, and I think a lot of people do as well, is that whenever, say, for example, Novak Djokovic gets knocked out early uh, from the French Open or when Rafa Nadal gets knocked out early from Wimbledon, as he did last year, and wherever Roger Federer gets knocked out of a German tournament, it's normally because the opposition suddenly raises themselves up to such a point where you go, they'll never play that well again. 
With Andy Murray, whenever he crashes out of tournaments, it's generally because he seems unprepared. He's hitting balls out all the time. You know, it's his own unforced errors that, that mean that he ends up losing the game. Well, so, something really interesting happens with some sports people with... When the, when, the, when the occasion is really big, often it brings out the best in them. And sometimes when they're playing against someone who they, they, everyone expects them to win, that individual finds it hard to get themselves really fired up. And, of course, the person who they're playing against, so that's their one big shot of doing something. You know, it's all mind games, isn't mm. it? I mean, someone yeah. I was talking to some athletes recently, and they were all saying that they reckon sport is 90% in the mind. And yeah. the mind is something that has to be worked on like any particular muscle. Yeah. And I would imagine that Andy now, he probably needs to change his focus a little bit of yeah. what is his next step of him becoming, you know, a true great player. Yeah, maybe you're right. Now, Pete, the thing is, uh, Andy Murray, and I have to say, our colleagues in Fleet Street this morning make no recognition of this at all, is in fact a knight of the realm. He was given a knighthood um, last uh, Christmas, and that must have weighed very heavily upon him. Do you not think it was foolish to imbue a man with a title which makes him so special in society, as well as a great tennis player, with all the additional pressures that that would bring to him trying to pursue his career as a, an athlete. I mean, again, it's probably something that he never thought would happen to him. And, you know, like some people expect all these people to be personalities and often they're just sports people mm. who just are very good at doing a particular sport. And I, I, mean, I don't know, Mike, you know, I'm sure you're going to get your knighthood one day, so you'll be able to tell I very much, it, I very much like. doubt that. Well, I wouldn't rule it out. But anyway, no, what I'm saying is, quite seriously, it was an un- another very unnecessary pressure that he didn't need. And the fact that he's never used it since, and the fact that nobody recognises his title because he, he doesn't like to talk about it, means it was a completely pointless and waste-of-time gesture by a politician to try and improve the politician's uh, place in life, not Andy Murray's. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't really get it. I mean, there's no, there's no debate yeah. in the fact of what Andy Murray has done and what he's achieved. And but it's like, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I suppose maybe one day you should have a debate about whether sports people should get knighthood. So. Yeah, well, while they're still playing, well, that's, that's it should a, be banned. That, that's a very good one to, to discuss. But yeah. I mean, if you were, for example, Pete, part of Andy Murray's team, mm. uh, and you were now uh, sitting down around about uh, uh, somewhere in SW19 in the rented house that he's going to be living in for the next couple of weeks. What would you be saying to him? Because this uh, was uh, the, the the defeat was the worst, second worst result by ranking in five years for Andy Murray. Uh, he lost to Guillermo Garcia Lopez, who was world's number ninety two at Indian Wells in March twenty twelve. This is a massive loss to him. I mean, surely this is going to be uh, doing terrible damage to his confidence, isn't it? Well, he's obviously got Ivan Lendl in his in his camp, who is someone who probably yeah. knows how to have the ice cold emotion of. Mm of just rising up and going, moving on. But for me, as a sports psychologist, when you work with athletes, I mean, I spent two years working with Ronnie O'Sullivan, and half the time it wasn't that I was giving him techniques and tools. It was more that I was just there listening to him, mm. letting him work it out for himself and just kind of supporting him, asking yeah. questions. Uh, well, because, well, listen, you know, it's, it's it, doesn't, it doesn't bother Ronnie O'Sullivan when he loses. You, you can bet your life he always comes back and wins again. And Andy Murray, people have forgotten this, lost four... Uh, major finals before he became a champion, okay, and that means he had to come back from four incredibly difficult uh, yeah. and and yeah. disheartening defeats. But he became a champion. That's what champions yeah. are. They can come back from defeat. Really? Yes. But well, that's that's why I suppose um, Djokovic is now with Andre Agassi. Because I mean, how many yeah. how many uh, finals did Agassi lose? I don't know whether you know that in Agassi's first. Uh, Final, he was more worried about his his hairpiece falling yes. off and actually winning. <laughs> he was, yeah. So he, well, I think he, I think I think yeah, but he he went as far as he could go with Boris Becker, didn't he, Djokovic? And now I yeah. think Andy Murray yeah. has gone as far as he can go with Ivan Lendl. I think it's time he found somebody else. It's Mike Parry. Mm. No, oh, for heaven's Mike sake. Are you sure, Pete? I mean, I'm, I'm slightly worried about it. I think the heat started to get to you, Pete. You started no. talking about Parry getting a knighthood. You started asking uh, whether he wants to help Andy well, Murray he's, out. He's just going I with the you've flow. you've lost the plot, Pete. Just go with the flow, Pete. You're, you're, you're very right. <laughs> Pete, it's been I'm great to talk to you. It's been great to talk Thank to you. Thank you for being on the show Thank because you, you have been a revelation. The world's number one sports psychologist, Pete Cohen there, uh, who's worked an awful lot with Ronnie O'Sullivan. Uh, could he re- repair the damage that Andy Murray has done to his own psyche? I don't think anyone can. Mm. He ain't winning Wimbledon this year. This is Talk Sport.
This is Talk Sport. We are the two mics, and of course, there will be a podcast coming out a little bit yes. later on. We've got some news about our New York show as well, we uh, which have. we have to bring to people a yes. little bit later on. The tickets are on sale now, mm. and we'll tell you how to get those. Uh, how about this one from uh, Dell, <clears throat> who says, There are only a few things more painful in this life than listening to Porky bumbling over Talk Sport's phone. Sorry, number. is your voice going? Absolutely now? painful. Is your voice going? Got a problem with your voice, sir? No, not really. I think you have. No. I think it's straining a bit. No, it's not. I think it's straining a bit. No, because, my voice is fine. Uh, you know, as usual, you're talking drivel. No, my voice is absolutely fine, but really? thank you for asking. Yes. Uh, how about this from Danny? He says, after becoming used to Porky reading the number out, I'm unable to understand it when you read it out, MG. Yeah, well, that's because you uh, you mangle mouth it. I will not have the number of uh, TalkSport mangle mouthed mm. out into the ether. OK. Which will be given consideration how about and deliberation. This? How about this one? Uh, this says that uh, from William. Yeah. Federer, Djokovic and Nadal all played like number ones when they were at the top. Murray mm. is a false number one. Mm. And I think that is the point. That's it's what people false get one. annoyed about because in the end, when you're the number mm. one at anything, you're supposed to represent present the sport, you're supposed to turn up and play as if you are the best at it, yep. and you're not supposed to get knocked out by the guy who is 89 places below you yeah. at a tournament which you normally would be expected to win. OK, good question here from Brian, who's a correspondent, thank you. I wonder if MG ever slated Tim Henman in the way he does Andy no, Murray. I Have didn't. you got something against no. Andy Murray, because he's a fellow Scotsman no. of yours? and the reason I did not hey. slate Tim Henman, mm. I know that it's difficult for you to understand it with your tiny brain, right? No, no, but no. here's the I'm thing. Tiny brain. Here's the thing. Mm. Tim Henman was never the world number one tennis player, right? He, so our expectations, our expectations of Tim Henman were never as high. We didn't mm. expect Tim Henman to mm. win Wimbledon. We mm. didn't expect him to win every tournament he was in. But when you're Andy Murray and you're the world's number one, we expect you to do well. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Tim uh, Tim Henman, I think, got to the semi-finals of Wimbledon six times. Yeah, right? I'm he wrong. was awful to maybe watch. Five, maybe Terrible four, to watch. Remember that six. ridiculous fist pump he used to yeah, do. Yeah, well, that's right. But I mean, but you should have been very, very angry if you, you know, still have the patriotic feelings about tennis players towards Tim Henman no. that you have towards Andy Murray. No, incorrect. Said, Tim Henman lost his bottle on six occasions no. and then managed to get through no. to the final. You see, you, what you should as be I predicted, you can't understand the difference between Tim Henman and Andy Murray. Let's talk to some more intelligent people Indeed. on the radio. Bill is a Rangers fan up in North Wales. Bill, very good morning to you. Good morning. Yeah, uh, hi, Bill. Thanks for that. Thanks for that accolade of intelligence, but I'm going to fix that. Mm. Um, I actually thought when I was listening earlier on, it was Andy Murray I was listening to. What a fantastic accent you did. Thank you very mm. much. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Andy's been pilloried by a lot of the press for a lot of years. Yes. He would never win a major tournament. He would never be number one. He would never do this, do that. Yeah. The knighthood's nothing to do with him. He's just gone out and done what he's done. But in our lifetime, we haven't had a number one or a Wimbledon champion. That's and we're right. not likely to again. That's right. Can people not just cut off the guy's back? Exactly. Well, hang exactly. on, Bill. Do you not think that if you are the world's number one and if you are supposedly the best player in the world... Mm at the game in which you excel, mm. that you, you you owe your fans something. I mean, people will have bought tickets, for example, to Queen's, right? And they would have had an opportunity to watch Andy Murray play, which you can't do at Wimbledon because nobody can ever get tickets for it. He's let an awful lot of people down here. He has, including himself, and I'm sure no one more than himself because he's a winner. Mm. And Why sure not? Apparently not. More than anyone else. He'll beat himself up more than anyone else over that display. But you know what? Look at the World Cup a few years ago. Would you have expected Brazil to lose 8-0? When they were tipped to win it. Well, I mean, they lost by a huge Champions score. sometimes don't perform to the best. That, that's absolutely right. And, and, Bill, the other thing is, you can have an off day, but you come back. Now, what uh, old MG is doing is he's slating the poor lad before he's seen how he's going to respond to this. His response he's not can going now... To respond. His response can... You see, you say that blindly. He's not going to. His response can only now come at Wimbledon, and I'm saying he's going to have a great Wimbledon. I'm not saying he's going to I win it necessarily, hope. but he will have a great Wimbledon. I certainly hope so, because, yeah. you know what, Britain needs another champion. Of course they do. Country. Of course they do. Yeah, well, unfortunately, Bill, we've only got the one champion at tennis, and mm. he has let everybody down. Let's try David, uh, who's up in Glasgow. Hi, David. Hi there. Yeah, yeah. hi, Dave. What would you like to say, David? Hey, I totally agree with you, Mike Parry. I've yeah. never heard so much rubbish come out of Mike Graham's mouth in all my life. Well, I have, got, regularly. You should listen more often. Yeah, exactly. You've got to give the guy a bit of credit. Mm. What for? Hi, for losing? Well, for getting dumped no. out of a, a competition by a bloke 89 places below him. Yeah, give him credit no. for that. No, you've got to give him credit, but the guy obviously had a great game. Andy Murray had an off game, but mm. Andy Murray will come back and he'll bounce back. Did and, you watch and, it, David? No, I was working, but I seen the kind of highlights of it. But oh, yeah. you've, yes. the guy, you've got to give the guy the credit. And I'd like to see the guy going on to win it. Yes, of course. Well, of he's course not going to, is he? This guy will get knocked out in the next round because he's not very good. 
No, he was obviously that good to beat Andy Murray. Yeah, but Andy yeah. Murray was awful. This is my point, David. You didn't even see the, the game, right? Yeah, yeah. So you can't really judge it. I watched the game yesterday afternoon, mm. and he was horrendous. Every single shot that he made went either into the net or it was out. Dave, what's Now, your, that what's... means that he was off his game by a massive amount. What's your day job, Dave? Yeah, I'm a plant operator. Right, OK. Do you have the occasional off day? Do you, you, know, do you leave a few uh, bits of scaffolding lying around that you shouldn't? All that kind of stuff, yeah. Oh, you, everybody has an off day. Well, aye? there you go. There you go. It was an off day. Yeah, well, that, unfortunately, thousands of people don't turn up to watch you work, David, do mm. they? Oh, I think, well, see if they did, you see the best operator in the world. Yeah, well, yeah. They, 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 well you should sell tickets for it then. Pardon? You should sell tickets for it. Oh, I, I should die. You've made a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. all right. Anyway, Let's talk to Janine, thanks, uh, who's a tennis fan up there in uh, Cheshire. Yes. Uh, Janine, very good morning to you. Hello. Yes, hi. hi. Janine. What would you like to say? I have tried to get on for so many times. But have you? There you go. Yes. Uh, yeah, I have. Um, I listen to Talk Sports a lot. Right, lovely. Um, whenever you talk about tennis, you drive me mad. Why? Right. Normally, you're on Andy Murray's back for mm. some reason or another. Well, I'm not. Uh, I don't know if I don't know if any of you are aware that he had shingles in he, February. He did, he did. It's I mean, a terrible, terrible affliction. Well, it, it it takes a lot of getting over. He's lost a lot of practice time. He's yeah. also had an injury. I'm sure he would want to be better prepared. And if you talk to him, he will probably admit he is a bit underprepared, but not through any fault of his own. Not yeah. because he couldn't. But you know, the grass season comes around. He's only probably going to be playing for another two years. Maybe if it was another year, he might have pulled out, but yeah. he's damned if he does, he's damned if he doesn't. No, that's not he? true. Because no, not true. Out. No, that's not true, Janine. Don't you think that he owes it to his fans to turn up for tournaments prepared to win them? He's the world's number one tennis player. You can't just turn well, up sure and go, I'm sure oh, I'm sorry, can. I'm not feeling terribly well. If he's not feeling terribly well, he shouldn't be playing. Well, I'm sure he was hoping to play mm. himself in, unfortunately. I agree. He came up again. He played. He came up. He's never. He's never been the fastest starter. Yeah. He's had some terrible first round games before. Yeah. You know, he's come into grass. He's not had a lot. He's yeah. <laughs> all of them. You will find some weird results in this week. Anyway, you there always will. always is at Queens. Yeah. I'm, I mean, we're all so disappointed mm. that he's not going to be there. That's right, we're Janine. What you, be what... able to watch him for long? No. Okay. What do you think about him being awarded a knighthood so young in his life and while he's still um, playing tennis? It's ridiculous, isn't it? I sort of, I sort of tend to agree with you. I, I think he possibly was awarded it as much for he does do a lot for charity behind the scenes. Yeah, you know, okay. he doesn't shout about it. Yeah. But I suspect that there's been, you know, there was an element of that. But I, I, I actually do fully agree with you. Yes. I think it would have been far better when he retired, probably. Exactly. Exactly. I and t- and, and, and so bound, that's bound, bound to have had pressures, extraneous so, pressures So, Janine, it him. sounds to me like you're making excuses ahead of Wimbledon for Andy Murray not winning it. <laughs> uh, no, you're not. No, you're not. Well, you let her answer. Do, do, do you know what? It would, I think tennis at the moment is in a, is in a real state of change. Mm. And I think you said, this guy's hopeless. He was number 90. A few years ago, a number 90 would have been hopeless. Mm. Nowadays... There are so many players that have got the potential yep. to go forward. Yes. You know, you can hit, you can get them on a day when they're on the up. You've got mm. an off day. Yeah. There are many of them. I think by the end of this year, mm. tennis will have changed completely. Yes. I know yeah. Rafa, well, you may, you may, Rafa could come back. You, yes. may, you may be right. I mean, certainly the, the analysts on the game yesterday were mm. saying, you know, analysing this guy's uh, the, uh, game and his, and his exactly. service. Exactly. You didn't watch it. You don't know what I'm talking about. I, I saw the highlights. No, like you didn't. Really oh, like the other Bill. guy. Yes. Um, and the point is, no, as they were saying, Andy, we don't... Andy we don't... had a terrible game. We, I'm not making excuses for him. Right. He had a terrible game. He did. But I'm sure he would say that himself. You know, yes. he just... But that doesn't help anyone, though, no, Janine, does it? Just because he says I had a terrible game. doesn't help anyone. doesn't help <laughs> anyone that bought tickets to see him in the semi-finals or the quarter-finals of Queens who now are not going to see him. No, and, and as I say, I'm sure he'll be yeah. more disappointed than ever. It's one of his favourite tournaments. Yeah. Yes, Janine, it's been exactly great to right. talk to you. And, and I'm Janine, sorry. I must apologise for I'm, Mike Perry's lack of knowledge about the I, game. I'm thank sorry, you very much I'm indeed. sorry about the haranguing attitude of uh, Mike not Graham, true. who has absolutely no, not true. Has no discipline or manners when he's talking to uh, our legion of uh, female listeners. How about this from Neil? He says, "MG, please tell Porky that Alan Ball wasn't an Everton player in 1966 World Cup. He bought. He was bought after that summer. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Uh, he, he played uh, for." for England against West Germany as a Blackpool player but he never played for Blackpool again yes. next time he put on a, a shirt on to play in the first division it was for Everton and uh, he made his debut 
at Fulham and we won 1 0 and he scored the goal. I don't wish to talk about Everton, okay? Well, you asked me. I would like to have a yeah. day off from Everton. Yes, okay. Would that be all right Indeed. with you? Indeed. Uh, Gabriel says this I suppose Sir Daniel Day Lewis retired because he and his fellow actors couldn't cope with the grandeur of mm. being a knight. Because mm. we've got to talk about Sir Daniel Day Lewis, who is retired from acting is he a knight at the as age well? of 60. Is he a knight? Well, he is, yeah. He's not. Yeah, of course he is. So, well, he's Irish, isn't he? What? He's Irish. Well, you can still be knighted. Well, can you? Yeah, yeah. I can't. I don't think you can if you're from the yes, Republic you of Ireland. You're just not supposed did, to use it. Sir what... Bob Geldof has also been knighted, by uh, the way. Well, that was an honorary one. Uh, for, yeah, yeah, but he can still days, use it. You, know. um, you can still use it. I didn't know Daniel Day-Lewis was 60 I don't know what you've got against either. the Irish. You're always having to go to the Irish. I've got nothing against the you Irish. Have. I've got you're many Irish going, friends. You, I love no, Ireland. You haven't. You haven't got any friends. I like going to Dublin or and uh, getting bladderated because right? it's a good town. Yeah, yeah, really. Um, have you seen the time, by the way? Yeah, I've seen the time. We've got to stop talking. Yeah, we've got had. Yeah, yeah, we've got lots coming up. This is Talk Sport. Wayne says, Mike, please tell that plank that Daniel Day-Lewis is English. Mm. Well, he's English. Great show, good. by the way. Well, why did you tell me he was Irish? Well, I didn't tell you he was Irish. Yes, you you said you. he's Irish, isn't he? And, uh, and I said, why have you got anything against the Irish? No, you said, yeah, I think he is. Mm. But anyway, you don't know nothing. Right. Uh, you don't know nothing. <laughs> you don't know. Another great uh, <laughs> yeah. solipsism yeah. by the man who mangles the English language more often yeah. uh, than a man who is not, in fact, English. You don't know nothing. Anyway, Joe points out about your attitude this morning. He says, uh, MG, have all these years of working with Porky caught up with you? You seem so angry all the time. Not at all Is angry. it the Porky effect? Yeah. Well, I tell you what, mate, mm. I calm him down. He'd be a lot angrier yeah. if I wasn't here. Do you know what mm. amazes me is that yes. there are many people out there who don't understand the nature of a radio show, mm. right? Yeah. They think that... Uh, that I spend my entire life in a complete mm. and utter grump. Yes. Uh, just because well, of do. what I say on the radio. Yeah. I'm not at all grumpy. Yeah, MG gets very angry when he suspects he may be wrong. Yeah. I'm with Mike Parry on this one. Lay off Murray, MG. That comes from Lee. Lee, really? thank you very much all indeed. Right. Well, the next time you buy tickets to go and see a sportsman yeah. of your, uh, you know, your persuasion, yes. and he doesn't turn up because he can't be bothered because he gets beaten in the previous round, yes. then tell me that you don't get upset because I think that's the problem that people have with Andy Murray. And He's let an awful lot of people down. Yeah, you think so Helm very kindly tells us Daniel Day-Lewis was born in Chiswick. Thank you very much yeah. indeed. Chiswick is a suburb of London. Uh, mm. Thank you. It's not a suburb of London. It's a part of London. Well, it's part of London. It's, it's not suburb. a suburb of London. Yes, it is. What no, is it, it isn't. It it's, 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 it's London. It's not a suburb of London. You don't say the mm. Piccadilly Circus is a suburb of London, do you? Chiswick is much further out. Chiswick no, it's, is yeah, near it's Barnes. Still, no, it's still part of London. No, it's a, it's a suburb of London and it's on the banks of the you River You don't know anything about London, you're from Chester. And the uh, the boat race goes past Chiswick yeah. every time the boat race is run. Which every is time I look at your boat race, it makes me feel quite unwell. Can't Let's you, talk instead to Dale very, Vince. very, unpleasant. Let's talk to Dale Vince, who is the chairman Indeed. of Forest Green, because, of course, uh, the EFL fixtures came out a couple of hours ago. Yep. And TalkSport and TalkSport 2 are the new exclusive home of the EFL. We'll tell you more about yep. that coming up. Uh, but let's talk to Dale, because it's a very exciting time. Dale, very good morning to you. Yeah, morning, guys. Yeah, hi, Dale. Thanks very much for joining us. What do you know about Barnet? Because that's going to be the team you first play on your debut in the Football League. Exciting times, eh? Yeah, definitely. I think Barnet will be a great test for us and we're at home for the first game of our you know, first season in the league. So that's great as well. We'll have a big crowd. Yeah. Uh, Barnet, we played them once before or a couple of times before when they're in the National League a couple of years ago. Right. So we, you know, I know the chairman. Sure. He's a good bloke. Uh, I don't know much about the team. I think they did all right last year, didn't they, in League Two? Yes. Uh, just very much looking forward to it. Well, that's fantastic. And what difference does it make to, to, to the team as a whole, Dale? You know, Forest Green had a great season last season. They've come up now into the Football League. What what are you expecting will change for, for everybody that, that supports the team and for the players and, and everyone associated with the organisation? Well, we've got a lot of bigger games than we had in the National League. Obviously, a lot of bigger clubs in League Two. Uh, you know, we're going to see an increase in gates. Our season ticket numbers have nearly doubled already, for example. Mm. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of finding it easier to attract uh, the kind of players that we're looking for to play the kind of football we want to play. That's much easier in, in this league than it was in non-league. Um, so for us, it's a big step up. You know, we'll be playing the same kind of football. Um, but uh, playing some much bigger clubs uh, with some bigger crowds. We're, it's great. we're so looking forward to it. No, it's great. Now, Dale, you are a very successful businessman and you, you have specialised in green energy and, and uh, you know, that's uh, very commendable. Have you ever thought about the difficulties of running successful business with successful football club now that you're in the Football League? And, for instance, take Mr Coates of Stoke City, a very successful businessman, runs a very successful club, but, you know, they have huge revenues and you are really going to have to balance the books, aren't you? Yeah, well, I suppose, firstly, I don't see myself as a businessman. I'm I'm an environmentalist and mm-hmm. actually I got into business in order to change the world. So I started out by trying to make a different kind of electricity and that's kind of like the beginning of the story. So mm-hmm. I use business as a method to achieve the outcome I'm looking for, which is to... Uh, 
uh, make the world in this country in particular more sustainable. So yes. football is the same kind of thing for me. It's a different organization. I've learned a lot. I've been doing it probably seven years now. I learned a great deal. Have yeah. a lot of fun doing it as well. Yeah. But football for us is a channel for our message and our work, the same as businesses, which is all about sustainability. And yeah, we'll, we'll balance the books in this league. Um, no problem because hmm. it's just a completely different place to being in non-league football. Yeah, sure. And as far as changing sure. the world yeah. goes, I mean, it's worked very, very well for you, Dale, as you, as you said. You've been doing it for, for quite a few years now uh, and the football business is, is, is uh, as sustainable as you can make it. Mm. Um, are you, uh, sort of, would you say that the world is moving in your direction, as it were? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think that every year, uh, only more so every year. You know, I've been doing this uh, green energy stuff for just over 20 years. We were mm -hmm. the first company in the world to offer green electricity, uh, for example, at a time when, you know, nobody even knew what it was. And every year, it's, it's like, for me, it's like a shift in the tide of human affairs is how I sometimes describe it. More mm -hmm. people every year get more concerned about the environment and what they can do, <clears throat> excuse me, mm. uh, you know, in, in their own lives to make a difference. Yeah. Now, one of the things that you have introduced, and I tell you, this is going to, um, you know, raise a cheer from your ground staff, the first solar-powered robotic lawnmower. Now, this is brilliant. So, yeah. uh, you know, whereas most um, groundsmen break their back in pre-season trying to get that grass right and all that, you've come up with a, a robot. Yeah, we call him the Mobot, actually. Oh, yeah, good. Um, yeah. yeah, and, and he, you know, he trundles around 24-7, does his own thing, uh, takes ever such a little bit off the grass, so small that we don't have to collect it. So mm -hmm. it, it drops back on the pitch and feeds the grass growth. And, wow. um, yeah, he helps grass, uh, the groundskeeper quite a lot. Yeah, that's fantastic, yeah. isn't it? Tremendous. And is there one particular fixture that you're looking forward to in the, in the calendar year in terms of uh, a place that you've always wanted to go and watch your team play? You know, I don't think there is. Uh, mm. Wembley was fantastic for us, uh, you know, a few weeks ago. Mm. Um, that'll be hard to top. I don't think we'll top that in the league this year. But who knows what we'll draw in the FA Cup or the Carabao if we get through round one. That's uh, right. So, you know, if we could get ourselves a premiership team, that'd be fantastic. That's right. And, and actually, that was it's so interesting you mentioned the Wembley final. You beat Tramere 3-1. I mean, compared to yourselves, Tramere are a giant club. Uh, you know, in the sense of Prenton Park gets crowds of about, I think, you know, seven, eight thousand, um, yeah. e even in non-league football. So you've really, really have conquered, um, you know, a, a very established club there. You're going to go to grounds now, which you're going to look at and think, wow, because some of those teams you're playing have had high echelon success. So is it an ongoing ambition that this is only the start? Do you want to climb the league? Yeah, the ambition we set out a few years ago was actually to get to the championship. And so being in League Two is our first kind of big step towards that goal. Yeah. Um, but uh, so we're here in League Two. We're very happy to be here, but we're not planning to stay here. Um, well, that's very that's years. very ambitious. But you've only got a five thousand seat to stadium, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, we have, yeah. Uh, well, we have uh, we have plans for a new home, right. um, which is uh, on the M5 at Junction 13, which is the kind of gateway to Stroud, where we're based. Right. Um, we've got a 100-acre site there. We've had a stadium designed for us by Zaha Hadid, which is a kind of architect firm of global renown. Yeah. Uh, it's it's going to be the world's first to be built completely out of wood. Wow. Uh, we, we call the place Eco Park, and mm -hmm. it's in the planning system now. Wow. And if we're lucky, we'll get outline consent this autumn. Mm. So we've got a plan for that as well. Um, mm. and, and so we're kind of working on and off the pitch to move ourselves up the league. Sounds I've, very I good. I think I've seen an artist's impression of that stadium. Is it the one that looks very, very much like a sort of spaceship? Yeah, that's yeah, it landed it's in very the cool of, looking. A meadow. Yeah. Yeah, it is fantastic. Mm. Yeah. Brilliant. And, well, let's hope that all works. Yeah, Thank indeed. you very much indeed for talking to us. Uh, Forest Green's yeah. chairman, Dale Vince, there. That's right. Uh, yeah, I've, I, think we, I think we saw this a, a few well, weeks back. I think you'll find mm. that the guy who's designing it, the architect, has also been involved in designing the, um, the Qatar World Cup stadium oh, yeah, okay. for 2022. Right. Jolly uh, good. In fact, I'm, I'm sure he does. OK. Uh, anyway, look, that's great because Talk Sport, We're out of Talk time, Sport by the way. 2, of course, is the new exclusive home of the EFL, is it, it is. not? It is indeed. And, and the fixtures that have come up today, mm. Sunderland Derby, Villa Hull, Bolton Leeds United, yeah. will all be live and exclusive on the network on the opening weekend Very of the season. Exciting. Very exciting stuff. Uh, Deck Ain't Barking says, Mike Chiswick has a London postal code W4, so Ooh. it is London. Yeah. I should know, as I was born and bred up the road in Hammersmith. OK, it's always, go. always great to have a smarty pants yeah. on at this well, time of the morning. correcting your uh, Im impressions that you give out, which are entirely wrong. This is Talk Sport. It's a neighbourhood. This is 
is like your theme song, this, isn't it? No. Don't play this at your funeral. No, don't be ridiculous. Mm. Honestly, a terrible thing to say. Well, not a terrible <laughs> thing to say. So why you got into full victim mode today, what by the way? What do you mean? You, you, you're sort of no. staggering about as if you're, no. you know, you're being very hard done well, by, by me or something. if you mean this, this is because... Yeah, what are you doing now? It's my sciatica... Uh, sciatica? ...exercise. I've got very bad sciatica yeah. at the moment, and it, as the result of... What is that? Why is that? What is <laughs> sci- sci- well, what's sciatica so caused hard. by? Is it caused by uh, a b- a bad living, it, a no, filthy no. lifestyle? No, no, it's caused by the tightening of the sciatica nerve, and that basically... Do you mind talking into your microphone? Yeah, well, I am, but I'm trying to just stretch as well. Hang, yeah. on, hang on, I'm just trying to get my... Yeah, my... You can, it does move, you know. And the it's, sciatica, on a, it's on an arm yeah, that's yeah, telescopic. Know, I, yeah, but the thing is, the sciatica nerve is so painful. Really? It's, it's like somebody gets a chisel, yeah. and then right at the lower part, the right-hand side of your back, uh. they can't take the chisel, uh-huh. and, they, and they get a sledgehammer, and they knock uh. the chisel down through your back, mm. down through the batokia area of your body. The tokial area. Yeah, and I into, thought you were going to go and see some and, acupuncturist, were you? Yeah, and then into the, the thigh, the front of your leg, <laughs> and it is so painful, I, yeah. can't, I can't walk, so I have to do these but exercises. So it's a ner- is it a nerve It's problem? a nerve. The satic nerve right, yeah. runs right down your body, and uh, when it tightens up, as it does, it makes it incredibly powerful to operate your leg but muscles what do you think, But what do you think is joints. the cause of it, though, is what I'm asking you? Uh, attracted, you attracted your hip. I don't know. I've been no. sex for years yeah. to try and get it sorted yeah. and some of them do it and instantly you jump off the table you feel right. better some have done it for months and months and nothing's is happened. it a hereditary thing perhaps or well not? it might be I, th- I think I, I th- no i don't think so i think a lot of people get it i mean with me it's very weird i what's happened is because of the hot weather mm. i've been tossing and turning in bed yeah. trying to get to sleep yeah and that has literally sort of thrown my right leg about a bit and it's got caught yeah. and, and it's trapped my it seemed like nerve. it was a little bit cooler last night but i don't know what Oof. robin Chernov was going on about the other day saying there was going to be a massive thunderstorm well, I closed all my windows. Gonna, yeah, because it was going to uh, suddenly the weather was going to break. It's going to start pouring with rain, and it's going to get about ten degrees cooler. I closed all my windows. I put all my yeah. uh, all my watering cans out in yeah. the roof garden right. to catch all this water yes. that's coming. I thought, well, I don't need to water the plants. Well, this it's, morning it's afternoon. It's going to because happen, there's a, t- a thunderstorm coming this yeah. afternoon, and yet then I go and see some competitive information of bureau yeah. which says no, no. Five day heat wave. Are you saying Robin's got it wrong? I'm not saying Robin's got it wrong at all. Yeah. Things must have changed since right. Robin made that prediction. I see. Now, right. a couple of uh, interesting tweets here. Yes. Uh, from Andy says this It will come yeah. as a bit of a surprise to Zaha Hadid uh, that she's now a bloke. What? Apparently. So. Oh, I see. Yes, she, yes, the architect. She, the architect, yes, yeah, I knew she's that. a she. I knew that. Uh, uninformed Porky Strikes again, no, says no. Mark. Uh, Zaha Hadid was a woman. Not a he, as he stated by the Plankmeister. But she's nothing she's now. She sadly died last year. I was going to say, she's nothing now. Well, what do you mean, nothing? Well, she sadly passed away last year. Well, that's not really sad. the way to describe somebody who's passed away. Well, you know, nothing. that's what you become. You're nothing. Now, listen, uh, I want to talk... You know, we played Money, Money, Money there. I want to yes. talk to you about something amazing. Today's the 50th anniversary of the introduction of the first cash machine uh, in Britain, really? unveiled by Barclays in Enfield, North London, on June the 27th, 1967. Right. And you know the bloke who, who advertised, you know, the first advert mm. for Bot Machines? Yeah. It, was, it was Reg Varney. Was it? Who the was, guy from On the Buses? Uh, I hate you, Butler. Yeah. You know, that was what the inspector well, used to say yes. to him because he played Stan Butler. He was Butler, yeah. Yeah, he was. But some amazing facts and figures I here. I wonder about... why it was Enfield that was chosen for the first place. Well, I mean, they've got you somewhere, haven't yeah, they? Enfield, a prosperous No, but you'd think it would be somewhere in the city of London or something, wouldn't you? Well, I, I don't know. Perhaps they didn't want to make it that, you know, that sort of focus. So Enfield's quite a nice place. I used to live near there. I used to live in Southgate. Oh, yeah, I uh, know Southgate, yeah. Sorry? I know Southgate. Yeah, Southgate. And, uh, I was, when, I, when, when I was a youth, yes. um, I used to uh, go out with a lot of the girls who went to uh, Finchley Girls oh, okay, Grammar yeah. School. Yeah. And some of them lived in Southgate. Yeah, I bet they did, yeah. So I used to go up from Palmer's Green to Southgate, yeah. and then we went on to Botany Bay, where there's a lovely yes. hotel just right. beyond Enfield. But anyway, look, um, the point is that uh, what would we do without them now? But some amazing things, really. For instance, uh-huh. some of the first cash machines, they didn't actually give you your card back. You put your card oh, really? in, you asked for your money, <laughs> and, then, and then it was either posted back to you by somebody right. in the bank, or you had to go into a branch to collect it How the bizarre. following day. How ridiculous. Yeah, I know, yeah, amazing. I mean, I certainly remember that there was a time when you kind of were taking your life in your hands when you were trying to take money out. That's right. Because at least 50% of the time, the thing would eat your card. You would eat your card. And you'd only ever have one card. Yeah. It would take about another month to get the new card issued, yeah? It, it would eat your card or it would send you the wrong money. The average withdrawal in the UK every time somebody goes to a cash register is £71. Really? I find that remarkably high because I often stand in a queue and I see somebody spending like seven minutes yeah. 
getting twenty pounds yes. out of cash machine. You know what the most annoying thing is as well yeah. is people checking their balance. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, you know, checking the balance. Well, you, when you're they standing there money. and you're thinking, yeah. you know, would you just move? Yeah, just well, do whatever you want to do. Uh, absolutely, just get out of the way. I, absolutely. Why are you keeping me waiting yeah. for your twenty quid? You right. know, I mean, if I only drew out twenty pounds and then went and had well, some last fish you long, would it? No, some fish and chips and a couple of pints of <laughs> beer, all gone, wouldn't it? So yeah. there wouldn't be. But also, I imagine that the 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 mean figure of seventy one quid is because some people take out a hundred and some people take out fifty. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, that's kind of what I tend to take out, 50 or 100. Oh, I take out 250. Do you? Yeah, I like that, yeah. yeah. I like to have a wedge So anyone in my who's pocket. standing behind Porky in yeah. a queue mm. will should know now that he's going to take out 250 <laughs> quid so yeah. he can knock him over the head and take the money. Well, up. absolutely right. Now, some myths have, bro, have uh, you know, arisen around the mm. cash machines. For instance, you remember the uh, Paul McCartney is dead thing on the front of Abbey Road? Oh, yeah. So what about this? Some people believe that if you enter your pin backwards into the machine, right. it will alert the police through a special line that you are withdrawing the money under duress, really? i.e. you are being mugged. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a myth. I didn't know that. It's a myth. Oh, is it? It doesn't work. Oh, okay. It doesn't work. So don't even bother trying To be it, honest, okay? I'm not, I'm, I would have to really, really study uh, the keyboard to do it backwards. You know, it's one of those things that you can do yeah. almost without thinking sure. forwards. Sure. But to think about doing it, it's like counting backwards, isn't it? Well, do you know, I'm very lucky there. It yeah. is like counting backwards, but my... Pin number on yeah. one of my on one of my yeah. cards reads the same forwards as backwards. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Is it now giving people no, no. pin number? No, no, I'm not. I'm not. I haven't told them any numbers are. <laughs> yeah, but they can work it out now. No, they can't. Yes, they can. For instance, if it was. So what's the first number? I'm not telling you that. Really? But supposing it was O one one O, yeah, then it would be the same backwards, wouldn't it? O one one O, like a palindrome. Like a palindrome, absolutely right. O one one O. There you go. That'll be. That'll no. be. Try that one. No, mine's not O one one O. Now, listen. This is the greatest fact. I've compiled a list of facts about bank machines, and this yeah. is the greatest one that I love. God. ATMs, that's... Uh, what, automatic that? teller machine. Oh, it's, it's, it's an American thing. Well, an American uh, bank, bank worker is a teller. It's a teller, who yeah. counts money. Yeah. So ATMs in the Vatican City right. will give you money, providing you can understand the instructions, which are written in Latin. In Latin, yeah. Isn't that brilliant? Well, I suppose if they weren't written in brilliant? Latin, they'd be written in Italian, wouldn't they? Well, I suppose so, yeah. But well, I, it's just as difficult to work out. Yeah, well, not for me. I mean, I'd work that out. Would you? Easy. You don't and need it, Italian. And in... Hey? Do you know any Italian? Yes. Like what? Uh, well, well, give me one Italian word that you know. Okay. Go on. Uh, la dolce vita. <laughs> That's Italian. Yeah, but you wouldn't ever use it in common everyday uh, talking, would you? Yes, you would. You'd, you'd, you'd buy a beautiful lady. Life. Yeah, you'd buy a beautiful lady a drink in yeah. a Swiss bar in Rome yeah. on the edge of St. Peter's Square. Okay. And then you'd put the drinks down and on the go, table. La Dolce Vita. <laughs> That's right, you'd say. <laughs> La Dolce Vita. Yeah. And then, right. and then she'd yeah. leave, presumably. No, no, no. no what about no, Buongiorno? Buongiorno. Yeah. That's right. Or Ciao. Or, ciao. Ali, or in her case, Arrivederci. Arrivederci, yeah. yeah. But no, in, in it- Italy, people say Ciao all yeah. the time. I always say ciao yeah. in Italy. Hey, by the way, ciao, ciao. By the yeah. way, I meant to mention this earlier in the first hour of the show. Andy oh, yes. Murray, that we were talking about, right? Yes. Do you know that he's just been named by the Daily Telegraph mm. Sport mm. Uh, as the uh, greatest UK sportsman ever? Thank you. Can you imagine Thank that? You. That backs up everything. So about I've bad said. timing. Well, no, he's a double Talk Wimbledon champion. Timing. He's a double Olympic champion. He's a US Open champion. I, I would say that's uh, very, very justified. Mm. By the way, just the last one on the cash machine. Yeah, go on. In Lapland, when you put your, yeah, your car in. The, before the machine gives you money, it gives you a blast of cold air because Why? when because when the when the mouth opens to take the money out, they want to make sure snow doesn't get in to corrupt the machine. All oh, right, isn't that amazing? And by the way, in America, and I've never seen this. Mm. It, the first thing that I um, was amazed in playing golf in America was the buggy that drives around with all the drinks on the back. Yeah, and you can stop well, and get drink. the drinks in it. Yeah, but the guy who comes around sells you drinks. Oh, I you know see. what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. And sells you a few drinks and and. Uh, well, in America, on some golf courses in America, there are mobile ATMs being driven around the course on buggies. Really? For people to dispense money halfway through the round. Must be if they're gambling, I Well, suppose. I suppose so, something yeah. like that, yeah. Shocking. But anyway, how amazing is all that? Yeah, that is amazing, yeah. Is, Have you yeah. seen the time? I've seen the time. This is still sport. Time. It's a good time. Explorer uh, is one of many people who has tweeted in, uh, and he says this, for anyone standing behind Porgy and ATM, mm. remember 2992. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, is that the uh, pin? No, nowhere near, I'm afraid. Is that not it? No. There's okay. millions of combinations, so uh, I haven't Wayne anything says, away. Uh, I'd advise Porky to change his pin number right now, the no, plank. Won't need to, honestly. Paul says, is Porky trying his hardest to be robbed and burgled? <laughs> no, not really. No, I don't fancy <laughs> either of those. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Danny says, don't forget that Mike Parry told us he draws out £500 a week in cash. Yes. He's lining himself up. What do you mean? 
What do you mean lining himself up? Well, because drinks? you give away too much of your own personal oh, information. Oh, don't worry about that. It's just a few bob to buy a few drinks if, if anybody sees taxis. you. Yeah, but if anybody sees you yeah. at an ATM, oh, I see. they'll know that minimum yeah. you're taking yeah. out 250 yeah. or possibly 500 quid. Yeah, but I need taxis at the moment because of my sciatica. Have I told anybody how much it uh, hurts? It's really painful. No, you keep going walk. on about it. Nobody cares. I'm Nobody not... is interested in how, your sciatica. How about, how about this? I actually paid to get myself a car to bring me into work this morning, what? okay? Because my sciatica is so painful. I thought so you were going to drive in this morning. No, no. You didn't drive in in the end? I didn't drive in. No, no. All right. Well, like... that's because you came in so early because you yeah. decided it would be a great idea to yeah. go and do the paper review well, on I... your own, yeah. despite the fact that we are the two mics, yes. because, you know, when anybody offers you a chance to go on the air, yes. you can't turn it down. Well, I mean, you know, people, you know, if I'm in demand, like sickness. I, what am I supposed to do? You know, Talk Sport is the company I've been with for many years. Uh, it's although, a bit of give and take, you know. Although I have to say, uh, mm. I was quite amazed that mm. you turned down old Jeremy Vine the other day, your mate, the, uh, you well, know, the mad cyclist. Well, I'll tell you what the story is. Mm. They, uh, they came on and, uh, as you know, they he seemed to regard me as an expert on a lot of You've subjects. You've been an expert on their show on, on uh, obesity. obesity. Yeah, and on, on uh, Coronation Street. On Coronation Street. Yeah. Also on uh, sort of uh, the whys and wherefores of, of popular behaviour on yeah. the tube. Yeah, that's that right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, Incredible. Uh, and so for some amazing reason, they rang me up um, earlier this week yeah. and said... Was it on Monday? Yeah, it was on Monday. I and, think it was and, Monday, And yeah. said, uh, could you come on tomorrow? You know, delighted to have you. We want you, your views on uh, Brexit. Really? And I said, so well, what do you mean? a bit down market. There, and, I, and, and they said, right? well, what do you think of Brexit? Was well, so Vince I, Cable not available? <laughs> Vince Cable wasn't available, that's right, yeah. So I gave them a few views on Brexit. Yeah. So, oh, I mean, this guy said, oh, genius, that's exactly what we need, you know. <laughs> so I said, look, it's a bit typical, fellas. I said, you know, I'm very busy at talk sport. I said, although I, you know, I admire what you do and all that, I, I don't think I can get involved in that. Oh, no, please, It's please. great, isn't it, though, when they ring you up and yeah, ask yeah. you for an immediate opinion. That's right, yeah. You know, like you walk yeah. around with all this stuff in your head. That's right, yeah. And uh, as soon as you give yeah. them the opinion, yeah. they go, oh, yeah, that's fantastic. Mm. Anyway, it subsequently transpired. They wanted me to do it nine minutes after we finished the show here on Tuesday, right? And I simply couldn't do it. I mean, the point is, I ha- have a, a huge allegiance to talk sport, and I wasn't going to sort of walk out of here, walk into another studio and do that. Yeah. And uh, and I didn't want people so to incredible. follow me. Yeah, but it turns out this morning, that we discovered Amazingly, that it wasn't actually his show. It wasn't Jeremy Vine. Somebody else was filling in for it. Who was it? It was Ed Miliband. Unbelievable. And they didn't even tell me. I mean, why they would he get a radio me. show? Well, he's a guest presenter, isn't he? Because Jeremy's away. Jeremy yeah, he's awful, said, though. Well, he's a dreadful communicator. He's a terrible speaker. He's a dreadful... He, 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 he seemed to whap his tongue around yeah. his teeth. Yes. And uh, he's a dreadful enunciator. And, he's not and, good. And communicator. But anyway, that's enough of yeah, that. Yeah, all right. Now, uh, Simon I'm, says this, by the way. So yeah. we now know that numbers two and three of Porky's pin number are the same. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should try and work out what it is. Yeah, well... Maybe like a test damn for everybody. Now, listen, so say it's two, two in the middle. No, what would it be on either end? Well, Don't forget the two other numbers are the same as well. I'm not getting into so that. So it could be three, two, two, three. Three. No, I'm not getting into all that, mate. Are we, are we close? Nowhere near. Oh, well, Nowhere so, near. so it's not a three or a two, then? You're a million miles away. So and, there's no and, two or no can three. You, can I just point out to you yeah. that if anybody ever did work it out yeah. by some a logarithm, which would take them yeah. 17 years, uh-huh. right, yeah. they would then still need the card to be able to get any money out of the uh, out of the account. You yeah. Know? yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's still stages, isn't it? Yeah. Now, listen, I'll tell you what I want to talk to you about, because yeah, this is getting really interesting. Okay. Uh, the, um, the Lions, of course, and the first test on Saturday morning yes, on talk sport. Live on talk sport. Just that's before right. uh, our show, the warm up. Just before our warm up show, that's yeah. right. But massive intrigue, you know, live and let die and all this what? kind of stuff. Live and let die. Why is it live and let die? That was about spies. That was about Simon, about uh, right? James Bond, wasn't it? You know, it was. Well, no, it was, a, it, was a, it was a song. Yeah, it was about a spy. It was called James Bond. Yeah, but it wasn't written specifically for all James Bond. All right, Bond, then. Was it? Uh, nobody does it better. Yeah, so. The spy who loved me, right? Yeah, so that's why. Anyway, look, the reason yeah. I'm telling you this is because it has been discovered that mm. the British and Irish Lions have asked their security team to sweep their hotel rooms in New Zealand right. for listening devices. I mean, did you, have you seen the way that the uh, New Zealand All Blacks dispatched uh, Samoa? as it's now pronounced yes. in the correct form. I don't need to bother spying on it. Was it 88 nil? The... Yeah, well, it, it, I think it was 83 nil. 78. But it went it? back down to 78. Yeah, 78 the final, nil. The final yeah. try was yeah. disallowed for a forward pass. Yeah. But basically, mm. they don't need to spy on the British and Irish Lions well, because they're so good, mm. they're going to slaughter them. Well, I don't think that's going to happen. I think it'll be a, I think it'll be a deciding game in the third. But anyway, it says, anyway. in an effort to eradicate the risk of espionage ahead of the first yeah. test against New Zealand on Saturday, uh, now it says the regular searches of the rooms for bugging devices mm. are being carried out by 
by a four-man team from security firm Veritas, oh, yeah. who worked with the Lions on the 2009 and 2013 tours uh-huh. to South Africa and Australia. There you go. And they even, you know, they, they're, they're upfront about it. John Feehan, the Lions chief executive, said, we have a security team who are very experienced in this sort of thing. Yeah. They're experts in electronic surveillance to ensure that we're not being look, uh, looked at or listened to. The team room, for example, is swept regularly, but no one is allowed in there unless they are part of the squad. But how do they know that these characters from the security team mm. are not going to leak details of what they found or are, are not actually going to plant some kind of device. Well, spying is a notoriously fickle business, yes. isn't it? Because you can be a spy, a double agent, yeah. double spy. Yeah. You could be a double, double spy. Well, you've done a bit of that, haven't you, in your time? What do you mean? Well, you used to pass information to the British government uh, that yeah. you discovered as a uh, as a journalist, which is, apart from the fact, yes. unethical against all yes. the rules of journalism, yes. you know, it proved that you were just a lick spittle for the establishment. Well, that's very harsh. What I used to do is, in order... For some free gr- in, pedo it, grigio. It, it, well, there was a bit of that going on in the embassy, I have to admit. Uh, but normally speaking, if I was asked to plant a question to a yeah. minister who was visiting the That's United States... That's a shocking States, thing to admit no, to. No, it's not, because it would raise an issue which would be beneficial to my country. I was very happy to do that. No, that you're not representing your country, you're well, representing your newspaper. Well, do you any, not know the difference? Uh, of course I do. Anyway, it goes on to say, nothing is perfect in this mm. life, and if someone is determined enough, they'll probably get something uh, from us, information-wise, but all we can try and do is ensure that they don't. We have a security team in there, and they do a very good job. Oh, yeah. Now, then they go on ridiculously to say... So this report. Time, uh, don't worry about the time. Uh, it says there is no suggestion that the All Blacks would be involved in such underhand tactics. Oh, of course not. Oh, well, who would be there? Right. Well, I mean, so who's going who's gonna to yeah. be spying on them, eh? I know. Eh? What a load of rubbish. I know. Is it going to be? That's ridiculous. You know, I mean, is old Shane Warne, you know, going to say, I'll plant a few spies, yeah, uh, a exactly. few uh, microphones in a, uh, <laughs> in, a, in a dressing room there for the English warrior? Yeah. Yeah. Ridiculous. Or the it? British. Absolutely yeah. mad. Mm. Pete says this Porky's pin number is either his birth date, 1942, or his waist and inside leg measurement, 44-24. That's very harsh. I'm not going to comment on that. This is Talk Sport. Yes. Bachelors Peas, official partner of the Betfred Super League 2017, are giving TalkSport listeners the chance to win four tickets to the Challenge Cup final at Wembley on Saturday the 26th of August. Absolutely, what a magnificent event. Now, not only that, you'll also get a signed Super League shirt of your choosing and 250 nicker, that's £250 spending money. Now, if you fancy winning that incredible prize package, courtesy of Bachelors Peas, please head to TalkSport.com forward slash win now. This is Talk Sport. We are the two mics. We're going to talk to Dan Fieldson in a moment. He's mm. written a very interesting book about uh, the success of European football uh, and how they've done it and, and uh, many of the, uh, brought their uh, academies, uh, the academies and things around. I just want to read you a few more before sure. somebody clones your card, by the way. <laughs> uh, a few more uh, tips yeah. about your PIN number. Yeah. Uh, John says, Porky's just reduced the permutations for his PIN from 10,000 to about 90. Hashtag plank. No. Uh, Wayne says... Uh, Mike, please tell that plank they don't need his card as well as his pin if they clone the card. Mm. Um, Mike says, uh, imagine being stood behind Mike Parry in a cash machine Mm. and he's inputting his number at the same speed he reads out the TalkSport phone number. Well, you know, I'm very careful about that and I'm very careful (laughs) about putting my number into cash machines. Don't you worry about that. We'll read you a few more. uh, I've laid a few false trails there to I mean, make sure that, uh, you know, I'm smarter than the average man. Right. I don't give well, facts away like Well, what we know is that your PIN number's made up of two numbers, basically. No, you don't. Two in the no, middle no. that are the same and two on the outside that are the same. Well, that's if I was telling the truth, yes. Oh, you mean you were lying again? Well, no, I'm not saying Have that. you actually told the truth ever <laughs> no, 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 in no. your life? I'm not Have saying Have you ever that. told the truth? Oh, oh, I always tell the truth. Really? I'm, I'm a truthful man. In fact, I can't remember the last time I told a lie. <laughs> now then, <laughs> I uh, can. we need to talk about to Dan. About five minutes ago. Let's talk to Dan because he is the author of a book called The Secrets of European Football success. Yep. It's a fascinating book. Uh, we're going to find out what it's all about. Dan, uh, a very good morning to you. Thank you for uh, coming on the show. Morning, chaps. Yeah, hi, Dan. Now, Dan, um, fascinating sort of um, project that you embarked upon. Why did you decide to do it, first of all? First of all, it was just going to be a personal indulgence. It was just something that I fancied doing, was going around and visiting these clubs. And it was only when I got there and discovered how interesting some of the things were they were doing that I decided I wanted to write about it. Mm. What, what sort of places were you going to, Dan? You weren't just going to the club. You were going to their academies? Were you going to their training grounds? What, what, what were you targeting? Yeah, so it, it was dependent upon the people I'd spoken to. Yeah. Um, some guys were working for the first team, other guys were working for the academy. Mm. 
there was some guys who were just agents. It was just uh, an attempt to meet different people working in football. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, I mean, you travelled by rail all the way around Europe. You started off at Paris Saint-Germain, you went to France, to Spain, to Italy, to Austria, to Hungary, to Germany, finished up at Ajax. Um, I mean, it gives you a pretty good grounding, I would have thought, uh, to, to, to walk into any Premier League club at the moment and say, look what I know, you should hire me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, I don't know about that, but... Mm. Yeah, it, there are things in the book that I think that not just clubs in England, I think all clubs could look at and there's a few little nuggets of information they might like. OK. Now, what sort of response did you get when you went to these places, Dan? Because, you know, a lot of the time I believe that uh, continental clubs look down on us in England as not having the proper coaching facilities, as not knowing how to, you know, produce great managers, coaches and, and consequently great players. Did you get a feeling about that? To be honest, I didn't really feel that because it's been for maybe 10, 15 years that I've been English guys going over there mm. and they're quite used to us now going over and trying to study their methods. Mm. And, and and when you say study their methods, was there any resistance or did they actually welcome you into their sort of inner circles and say, no, look, yeah, come on our training pitch, watch this? To be honest, that was something that really took me aback was how open mm. and sharing a lot of these guys are. Really? And mm. nations like, uh, well, the Netherlands in particular, mm. you know, the reputation that they have for developing youngsters, it comes from that mentality of being so open and sharing. Mm. Yeah. And you were an academy scout at Liverpool as well for a period of time. I mean, do you see them doing things differently in, in their academies in Europe uh, than the way that we do things here, or is there a sort of common bond? That's a good question. Um, in England, in, in most Premier League academies, you know, we are, we are the global league, so we're using all of the methods that well, the best of the, the world, to be honest, our academy manager, he he did his thesis on Ajax. Yeah. We had the bridge to the first team, was a guy called Pep Linders, and he's from Porto. Mm. So what I wanted to see was when I went round Europe, were these places retaining their identity or was it an amalgamation of sameness? Yeah. And to be honest, I did find that they were keeping their cultural uniqueness. Yeah. Uh, what they do, they'll look inward at their own environment mm. and they'll they'll shape the way they operate around that. So, for example, if you say Feyenoord, yeah. Rotterdam is this really tough working-class place, yeah. and they want their kids to kind of represent that. So mm. there's no indoor facilities. If it hailstones, the mm. kids play outside in the hail. Right. You know, if it's windy, they get wind in their face, and they want to make them tough. Yeah. And because the parents are so receptive of that, they get success from it. Yeah, mm. I see. That's amazing. Now, travelling around and learning things like that, Dan, not only did you acquire information about what the Continentals do, <laughs> excuse me, but you must also have started thinking, well, this is where we're going wrong in England. You must have realised the mistakes we're making here. I, I think, personally, in England now, the, the wheels are in motion towards a better future. I think, honestly, in my lifetime and our lifetime, we will see England start to compete for World Cup titles. Yeah. Especially if you look at well what the under twenties did a few weeks back. Yes. There's gotta be a sort of cultural awakening mm -hmm. in England that guys like John Stones, yes he takes maybe one or two touches, mm. too many in the box and fans get apprehensive, mm. but that's the way the game's evolving. Mm. You know, mm. and we've got to start to appreciate it. Like in the nineteen eighties, for example, um when Barcelona started to play in their famous style of football. Yeah. The fans didn't like it. Mm -hmm. When Baccaro, he, he kept the ball instead of turning and attacking quickly. Yeah. They booed him. Right. And we've got to evolve like the, the guys on the continent did mm. and come to appreciate this is the way the game's going. Yeah. Sure. Mm. And, I mean, we hear an awful lot, and you've addressed it in some ways uh, just now, about you know young English kids going into academies and then kind of not quite making it into the, the first teams at Premier League clubs. Do you see any kind of advantage or, or, or any sign that, that maybe English kids could go to some of these academies in Europe and try and come at it a different in a different way, if you know what I mean. Most definitely, yeah. Because what what they do in Europe, which we still don't do, and I, I don't think it will happen, is the the B team structure. In that, the, a guy will join an academy aged eight or nine, and he'll play this style of football, and it'll transition up smoothly. When he's eighteen, the style mm -hmm. of football is still the same. He'll go into the B team, which is still the same style of football as the first team. Mm -hmm. So if you take Andres Iniesta when he joined. Barcelona, he was greeted the first day he went to train with the first team. He was 16, and he was greeted at the gates by Luis Enrique, mm -hmm. and he was introduced to Pep Guardiola. And, you know, and these guys would go on to coach him, yeah. all in the same style of football, right. yeah. Yeah. which is something that we still 
don't really have because of various agendas, because maybe sure. the short-term mentality of mm. Premier League managers. Sure. And and just to develop my colleague's point, Mike's point, this dossier you've got now, it, well, it was a dossier, it appears in your book, it's called The European Game, The Secret to European Football Success, Daniel Fields End. I mean, uh, you had a laugh earlier when Mike said, well, you know, you know lots of things that other people don't, but so, quite simply, this book should be read by people in this country. Are you getting the feeling that they're doing that? Yeah, I, I had an email this morning, actually, that every single um, copy that's being printed is off the shelves already, so we've got to reprint the book again. It's the top seller on Amazon at the moment. <laughs> that's brilliant. Yeah, so I'm mm. delighted. It's my yeah. first book, my first venture into writing, yeah. and it's gone well. OK. I mean, he sounds getting... like he's done better than you. Well, yeah, he, no, no, nobody's done better than my <laughs> original bestseller. You know, there's an awful lot of bubbly really? in Brazil. OK. Uh, but, Dan, what I was saying is, have you had any feedback from the industry itself? You know, have you had a coach or two saying, wow, I've read your book and uh, I, I found it very illuminating? Not as of yet, but maybe after this interview. <laughs> well, exactly. exactly. Well, you never know. Here for. And let's ask you just briefly before we let you go, uh, Dan, about Liverpool and uh, the, the sort of future season coming up because uh, Jurgen Klopp's obviously uh, taking them into the Champions Sorry, League. Sorry, you're assuming Dan's a Liverpool fan, are you? Uh, well, he used to work for Liverpool. Yeah, well, that doesn't mean he has a Liverpool fan. I didn't say he was a Liverpool no, fan. No, exactly. Why are you I'm asking him because he, was a wor- he used to work at Liverpool. Well, he might be an Everton fan. Uh, well, he might be. Yeah. Are you an Everton fan, Dan? I'm not. You assume correctly. Uh, no, thank no, you very much don't. indeed. I don't know why Porky Bull's interrupting. He talks <laughs> such absolute rubbish. The well, point hang, is... Hang on. Jamie Carragher used to be an Evertonian. Why Steve are you talking McMahon about Everton? Used to be an Everton. He can't help himself. Robbie Fowler. We're not talking about Everton. We're talking anyway, about Liverpool. What I was on. going to ask you about... Uh, sorry about this, Dan. Uh, was just, you know, the, 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 the season ahead, basically. I mean, is there going to be a need for Liverpool to bulk up the squad a little bit? And, who, and, and where are they going to go for those players? Because, of course, the Champions League is going to be very important, isn't it? Yeah, we, we do need to bulk up. There's some positions we still need to fill. But I'm also, I, I come from a youth football uh, perspective that I want to see guys like Joe Gomez getting a game. Yeah. You know, these young English kids. And I, I'm apprehensive that every single sign we make, it, it hinders the chance of them getting into the first team. Sure. Mm. And do you think there's a, there's, a, there's a wealth of talent there that they could, they could sort of, uh, you know, dig into? Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. That would be great for everybody to see, I think. That would be tremendous. Would. Well, listen, Dan, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, the Dan. Book, uh, of course, is called uh, The Secrets of European Football Success. Ooh. He's already told us that uh, it's number one on the Amazon uh, book chart, so yes. uh, very well done for that. Yeah. And uh, go and get it from uh, all good booksellers. Coming up, uh, we've got Porky Vision a little bit later on, uh, and I've got a couple of great tweets here. Uh, one from uh, uh, Iceberg, yeah. who says, I bet Mike Parry's pin is comprised of his favourite player's jersey number or birthday. I don't think you're far wrong with that. Ooh. And Alan says, Porky's pin number is like a game of mastermind. Mm. Do you remember that game with the Oriental woman on the front of the box? Mm. Hashtag 8778. Mm. Is it that? No. This is Talk Sport. <laughs> this is the two mics on Talk Sport with Wick. Save 35% on selected lawn mowers like the Flymo 37cm electric lawn mower was 79.99. Now, just 49.99. There might be too many lawn mowers out on the streets of London later on today. Day of Rage coming up this afternoon. Yes, Are you going to go and join in? No. I think I might go up there. Um, I can't be bothered, to be honest. Uh, most of them, are, <laughs> in my view, most of them are full-time agitators. Well, they are. If I, if people have got a genuine cause yeah. and they and they want to make their sell their presence felt, fine. Yeah. But you know what happened under successive Tory governments, Mrs. Thatcher? These guys all came to London, started breaking down scaffolding, smashing oh, the windows. Council tax. Yeah, uh, council poll tax. tax I should yeah, say. poll tax. Yeah. Council tax. Call it what you want. It happens all the time. And it's happened to, uh, you know, it's happened to all governments since. But it's all, I mean, one thing that they, all these demos have got in common is there's always a lot of planks at the front holding up Socialist Worker Party yeah, banners. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, nobody ever votes for the Socialist Worker no, Party. They all they seem to do is walk around with a load of banners. I didn't even know the Socialist Workers Party still existed. Well, I don't, remember a... them, I don't remember them standing in any elections, no, do you? No, they're just a group of blokes who get together in a pub with blokes beards and, and sandals on and start whinging about society. Well, there's no whinging about oh, I don't think they've got it. beards and sandals. No, why, these are, these why are don't the, you get involved? No, these are the agit prop types. They've got Got yeah. hobnail boots yeah. and they've got masks. Oh. They don't. They're not interested in a democratic debate. They're not interested in standing for any kind of election. Yeah. What they're interested in is smashing the place up, smash the place up, and yeah. going. You know, yeah. you know, a class war and all yeah, that. Nonsense. What a revolution! Yeah, class war. But anyway, the reason that it's focused today, of course, yeah. is because we're. It, what has it been called? The day of rage. Day of rage. Yeah. Day of rage. Yeah. And day the, of ragu. Our, our our colleague Julie Hartley Brewer, an expert in all things political, is calling it the day of wage. Wage. Yes. Because you know that's, uh, that's the millennials something. are all out saying, yeah, it's not my government. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I didn't vote for it. Yeah, and all that kind I of mean, stuff. really? But anyway, we've just witnessed the traditional um, 
what is it? The traditional the Queen's speech. Queen's speech and the prelim to it. And the, the the bit of the ceremony I love is Black Rod. Yes, because Black Rod walks up from the com- the, the Lords Chamber yeah. uh, across the divide to the Commons Chamber, and as soon as they see him coming for six hundred years now, they've been slamming the door in his face. That's what you do. Yes, but there's a really hefty slam. I mean, mm. you can see it shaking on its uh, yeah, on, you know, on, it, on its. It's hinges. one of those great old British traditions. Yeah, of course it? it is. And then Black Rod turns his rod round. Yeah. and he goes. Three times he yeah. knocks on the door, uh-huh. and then they open the doors and let him in. Yes, it's a traditional thing. And then mm. he comes in and he says, "You're summoned to the chamber of the House of Lords, their lordships, and Her Majesty the Queen." Right. Then they all file through. The Queen's looking rather casually dressed, by the way. Uh, no, she had a blue outfit on. Her no, but it's like a Everton blue coat. coat. Does she not, should she not be wearing the ermine and uh, the crown? And no, all that? because no, no, definitely not. Um, I see Why what you not? mean. Well, because because Prince Philip wasn't with her. He sadly appears to have He's gone been into taken hospital. Ill, I think. Yeah. So Prince Charles, in his full morning regalia, yeah. is uh, is there now. The Queen wanted to get this out of the way pretty speedily. Yeah, because she wants to hop it down to Ascot, doesn't she? Of course she does. She hasn't missed Ascot in fifty years, yeah. and she wants to get down. There's got a couple of horses. Well, you admit, it must be very warm inside the old. Uh, uh, Westminster Palace because it must be, uh, yeah. although it's made of stone yes. um, there is no air conditioning in there uh, that's, right, that's, that's right now I hope that the day of rage doesn't upset any travel arrangements around the capital because that's another thing that annoys me yes. every time you get a march well in the capital, I wouldn't go anywhere near Whitehall if I were you yeah I won't be going anywhere near Whitehall no where are uh, you going later uh, later I shall be Got heading any plans uh, well back down to Stockbroker Belt oh, yeah. of course yeah Okay. Uh, in, in an effort to try and find some solace in I was thinking I might get a haircut weather. at some point maybe today or tomorrow a haircut why? Yeah, well, we're doing on Sky on Monday, aren't we? Oh, yes, of course we are on Sky next Monday, yeah. yeah. Don't we'll look too scruffy. No one look too scruffy, and we'll be arriving here quite late on in the morning. Well, we're going to have a mad dash, I think, on, is the way to describe it. It's a mad dash from Sky. I'm not Sky. entirely certain that you've worked this out to the yeah, best of our abilities. It's, it's a mad dash from Sky to here. You've on... told me that we're going to get on the back of motorbikes. We are, motorbike taxis. <coughs> you sure that's safe? Yeah, of course it's safe. Are we insured? Well, yeah, the, well, the bikes are insured. But well, are we right. insured? Do I have to take out extra insurance? Well, it's up to you. If you well, think I, you're worth, you know, if you like think you're worth anything, yeah, but like yeah. lots of things that you organise, mm, it's mm. done in a kind of a slightly half baked no, way, it's not, not. and it's only later that we discover that oh, we shouldn't have really done that. No, not at all. I, not, I don't have confidence in your planning. Uh, well, for this. well, you know that's up to you. You take your chances, mate. I know exactly. I'm not going to take my chances. I've got a family to raise. Yeah. Right, I can't afford yeah. to become uh, in mm. some way. Um, uh, you know, crocked oh, really? by falling off a motorcycle. Really? Well, I don't want you crocked, because I'm crocked at the moment, and I want to say... Oh, thank how you are you ever going to get on a motorbike with your sciatica? Well, I hope it'll be better by then. But I want to say that uh, I'm very grateful to the number of people who've um, sent in messages, you know, texts or tweets or something like that, oh, yeah. saying, Porky, we really empathise and sympathise with you, with your sciatica. It is indeed a terrible affliction, and you are very brave to uh, soldier on throughout the morning and throughout life with that sort of pain down your, the back of your body. Yeah, and, all right. And I think mean, that's very Stop kind. Stop searching for sympathy. Very kind. Jamie says this, mm. if his pin isn't just the same number, mm. then there's only 89 possible pins. Hashtag plank. Mm. Uh, Jason says all four numbers are the same. Mm. His attitude has given that away. Uh, no, I'm not saying um, anything about that. Porky has mm. actually, says one uh, texter who's texted into 1889, Porky has actually reduced uh, his pin identity from yes. 9999 to 1, yes. the 9999 to 1, mm. to 162 to 1. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, well, there's 162 combinations there, so yeah. you can all have a go at that one. And yeah. uh, Ernie says it's easy to guess Porky's pin number, 0001, mm-hmm. because that's how many friends he has. Mm-hmm. Hashtag uh, porky no mates that's really harsh isn't it you know yeah. and i don't take kind of those sort of things so is that right is it zero 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 one no okay no no uh, pete right. says if porky's pin consists of two numbers twice mm. could it be 54 54 inches equates to his height four <laughs> foot six that's a bit harsh isn't that it? Is a bit harsh yeah. no that's, people are really that's, getting into this yeah i know it's nowhere close as uh, how about again. 1966 says andy is that the pin number no because uh it wouldn't uh, yeah i suppose it uh, no it wouldn't because then it wouldn't read the same in reverse would it uh, no, no so he hasn't so been listening. Not, but no. then you did say that you, were, uh, you weren't actually uh, telling the truth earlier. Well, I, I suggested I might not be, just to confuse people, yeah. you know, because uh, you can't really be as straightforward as I am without without risking, you know... You your... call yourself straightforward. I'm you? very straightforward indeed. Now, coming up in the next hour, yep. we've got an old friend of yours coming on. Uh, my Michael man Cole. by the name of Michael Cole. Michael Cole, now, wonderful. did he not used to be the Royal mm. Correspondent at the BBC? 
He was Royal Correspondent at the BBC. Yeah. He's an absolute gentleman. I've never met a more gentlemanly man than Michael Cole, actually, nor a more intelligent and, uh, and well-presented uh, man, you know, in terms of presentability of intelligence and style and all that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. Um, I knew Michael well in the uh, journalism years, but I knew him better, probably, when he became a director of Fulham because he was... Um, uh, in gainful employment with companies involving Mr. Mohammed Al Fayed. Yes, wasn't he not his spokesman for a long time? Well, I think he, I think he spoke for him. I don't think he was his official spokesman. Well, he was his he spokesman. Worked, well, he may have been. I know he spoke for him. But anyway, it was a rhetorical question, actually. Yeah, and uh, you know, once or twice I've been there uh, with Michael, and met Mohammed, and uh, you know, all the gang, Mr. Kenwright from uh, Everton, and all that. Oh yeah. And uh, fabulous days. But now Michael has come up with. Uh, an amazing uh, bit of research mm. theory on the house that he lives in, oh, yeah. which is uh, in one of the shires. OK. And he's going to tell us all about it next. Right. Mm. OK, well, that's all coming up in the next hour. Plus, of course, Porky Vision. This is Talk Sport. Oh, yes. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Graham. He's Mike Parry. You're listening to the two mics on Talk Sport. Coming up in this hour, we're going to talk to Michael Cole, the former royal reporter uh, and former spokesman for Mohammed Al Fayed. Uh, he's going to tell us a few stories about what's been going on at his new house, which is quite unusual. Uh, also, he might tell us a few tales about taking Porky down to Craven Cottage at Fulham as well uh, during the time when Mr. Al Fayed was indeed the owner. Also, it's Porky Vision time as well, and we're going to have to work out precisely what the Porky quiz should be, uh, which will be coming up, of course, on Friday's show. 08717 22 Four. You're listening to the two mics with me, Mike Graham and Mike Parry on Talk Sport. A couple of uh, tweets uh, to read out yes, to you. Um, a couple of other suggestions about your pin number, mm. right? Mm. Uh, and one, and one from uh, Julia, uh, your good friend, who says, "I'm guessing Porky's pin number is one eight seven eight. Can you think why? Uh, my pork chop. Seriously, I think you should change it now. Yeah, no, it's not that anyway. I'm so not sure don't worry about that. Seven eight. And also, uh, Paul has very kindly sent in mm. a, uh, a piece of information from Lloyd's Bank, mm. uh, which says, uh, "Don't let criminals steal your information." And no. he's got a little yeah. uh, handy couple of hints there for uh, you. Absolutely. So, not to give your PIN number yeah, away. Well I, well, I haven't given it away, and, and I won't be doing that. Now, no. uh, okay. rather a cruel one here, says, uh, you two guys are on motorbike taxis next Monday. Yeah. Do they make loaf-faced size uh, <laughs> self-safety helmets and plank uh, head-sized yeah. safety helmets? Well, I You hope guys so. will need them. Yes, I hope right. so. Yeah. It's going to be very hot, by the way, if it's like this, isn't it? Uh, so Put a crush on well, it. Well, hopefully it will have broken by then. Are you going to bring some leathers? No, of course I'm not going to bring you leathers. Why not? Well, I want to wear leathers Well, what for? if you come off the bike? Well, I'm not planning to come off the bike. Yeah, I know. You're not planning yeah. to, but that's yeah. why it's called an accident, because yeah. you don't know it's going to happen. Yeah, well, these guys don't have accidents. They're, really? they're experts. Yeah, they'll right. be fine. Well, I'll tell you what's interesting. We by were the talking way, do, earlier. You, do you have to reach back and grab the, you know, the sort of... Uh... No, I think you have to put your arms around the guy who's driving it. Oh, really? Mm, blimey. That's not going to be very no, pleasant, no, is it? No, Especially for him. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Ken is a West Ham fan, right? His yes. father-in-law apparently installed the first ATM machine um, in Enfield. Unbelievable. That you were talking about with yeah. Reg Varney. Let's find out what the story is. Yeah. Ken, very good afternoon to you. Yeah, hiya, Ken. Oh, he's hung up. Maybe he's lying. <laughs> no, no, maybe he's just uh, been cut off. Um, but that, that is uh, very exciting indeed. Yes. Uh, no, what I was going to say about the uh, the taxi motorbikes, yeah. don't you have to hold on to the bar at the back behind your, your, no, your back? No, you have to put your arms around the guy in the front. You sure about uh, this? Well, that's what I'm going to do. Oh, is it? OK. Because, I... I mean, I'm not going anywhere, basically. Yeah. Because, uh, it's, one, it's very hard to hold on to, to something yeah. with your ha- arms behind your back. I've only that's been right. on, on a pillion on a bike a few times. Yeah, so have I. When I was at university, a few yeah. of my mates yeah. had uh, motorbikes. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. it's very uncomfortable to try and hold your arms back I like agree. That. You almost feel like you're going to... Yeah. Yeah. Throw yourself off the back. Also, I'm going to have a bag as well. Uh, well, you so have... have to put the bag like sort of in between your legs, I right? So, and then reach around and grab the guy in front of you. I suppose so. And and, and sort of bear hug. When him. I've seen two seater bikes like that, yeah. the back is more like an armchair type design. You know what I mean? Oh, you're well, so, like the old so... Harley Davidson. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, it's not going to be like that. I think it is. I he's think not going to turn up in a chopper, the guy, is he? Well, he is. Yeah, because no, he's it's, not. A, it's a motorcycle taxi. Rubbish. So it's not going. Well, he's not going to turn up on a Honda Fifty, is he? Well, a Honda Two Fifty, maybe. Well, a Honda Fifty, and ask you to sort of you know stand with one foot on the back and hold on to his head. <laughs> you know, as you pirouette around. I mean, that's not going to happen, All is right. it? Well, I'll tell you what. We've got Ken back for Let's get him now. Back. Let's see if, what, uh, if, he, if he's there now. Ken. Hello there. Can yeah, you hi. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, hi, yes. We, we uh, were a bit yeah, worried there. As soon as we introduced you, you disappeared. And we thought yeah, you suddenly got, oh, no. suddenly got so cold feet. Now, this is a fascinating so tale, this, because, first of all, I didn't realise that the first ATM hmm. machine was installed in Enfield. Do you have any idea why it was installed in Enfield? No idea at all. My father-in-law worked for John Tan. 
right. who installed the, the first machine. Mm. And I think they were in competition uh, to try and beat the NatWest down the road. Oh, I see. I see. Right, what, ha- what actually happened is that because they had all the cameras there, the cameraman and Reg Varney, yeah. and it wasn't quite ready. Right. Um, it, it didn't actually work properly. Mm. So when they put the check in, which I had to do, they put a check into the thing, there was a man inside mm. who popped the ten pound note out. Oh I see, I see. So, so there was no actual electronic uh, no, uh, it, uh, business no, going on that at all. It wasn't working quite right, yeah. <laughs> so, so the little man was the electronic man, yeah. yeah. That's great. What a great story. In, so this guy was literally like hiding behind the letterbox, so to speak. And then he, it's like something he, out of the Flintstone. Yeah, that's it? right. He was, yeah. he was. He was inside the bank, yeah. Yeah, yeah fantastic. And he passed the £10 out. That's absolutely marvellous. And, yeah. and did your father-in-law then go, get involved in sort of doing all the, all the other ones? Because there was, this, I suppose, he, once the yeah. first one was done, there was then a load of them rolled out. He did. He eventually did. And in the end, he started up his own firm and uh, he went from... Small to big. Did he? Oh, yes, really? He well. That's yes. absolutely fantastic. Yes. Well, that, that's great. And is your father still with you, Ken? He is, yes. Yeah, in his late 80s. He's out playing golf at the moment. But really? Yes. Well, well, that's that's a bit hot, it's a bit hot for that sort of behaviour, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, yeah. Nevertheless, to know that um, the man who installed the first ever ATM in this country mm. is still walking the earth is an incredible he piece is. of history. He incredible is. piece of he history. Is, yes. It's like saying, yeah. you know, that Why? Henry Ford Why? is still walking the earth, the well, man no, who invented like, the first car no, and all that like, kind of no, stuff. Well, it, well, it's not like that at all. It is, it is. Ken, listen, thank you very much thank for, very for much, calling Ken. in. Mm. I don't understand why you're so surprised that somebody who was involved yeah. in putting in the first ATM machine yes. is still alive. Well, because it's it's something we take for granted. Not that long ago. It's something that the new generation and even the last generation of people have always taken for granted, and yet the guy who actually installed the first one and revolutionised everybody's lives is still around. I think that's fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Now, how about this from uh, Damon? And he says, it wouldn't yes. surprise me if Porky's pin is 1979, the date mm-hmm. Weatherspoons was founded, oh, or really? 0012, mm. the position Everton will finish next season. Uh, 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 very funny indeed. Well, mm. I'm, I'm dismissing the second one as rubbish, and the first one, I didn't know they were founded then, but no, I'm afraid you're not even warm. Uh, not Amanda even warm. from Kingston upon Thames mm. rather unkindly says, Mike, mm. how can Porky uh, get his arms around anybody? Surely they're too short. Oh, oh, oh. Very <laughs> funny indeed. Uh, and Simon I'm, says, hey, yes. the two mics, you hold on behind you as a pillion. However, mm. they may have Honda Gull wings which basically have armchairs well please be safe i tell you he's got a, a honda a gold wing yeah andy townsend has he and andy turned up on here at one isn't uh, it gold wing no it's a gold wing gold it's wing. a gold wing I've so that's it. a different type of bike well i saw him yeah it's, it's no the gold wing it's not a good there's no gold wing it's a gold oh, wing there right? is no gold wing and the gold wing is the honda equivalent of the triumph bonneville okay okay yeah and uh andy came down one time all the way from the midlands on his bike he's got a full bike license you know and uh, he turned up, you know, on his... Uh, don't call it a hog. You call um, the Bonneville a hog. You call uh-huh. it uh, your, your uh, machine or something, don't you? What? I think you call it your machine. Your machine. Yeah, your machine, yeah. Right. And he turned up and parked it out the so. back. It took up as much space as a car, by the way. The huge things, these uh, motorbikes. And then when we finished the show, he was going off somewhere and came down, put his helmet on, you know, started his uh, machine up and, you know, roared around the car park a bit and whoosh, he was away. Yeah. So it's a great uh, and yeah, efficient but if you're way of travelling. It's a great efficient way of travelling if you're used to it. Yes. But we're not used to it. Well, all you've got to do is sit on the yeah, back. Yeah, you say that. The guy, the, yeah, you the make guy it does sound the like rest. it's very simple. It is very no, simple. No, it's not. You've got to lean in a particular direction. No, you haven't. That's the whole thing. Oh, what, you don't lean? You don't lean. The whole really? thing about being on a motorbike yeah. is if you try and lean in any direction uh-huh. except along with the rider, you will. You, the bike will fall over. Really? You, they'll instruct you, honestly, when you get on, to say, do not lean. If you think we're going too low around a corner, do not try and lean the other way I see. to hold yourself up. Lean into the corner with me. Trust me, we've never... So uh, you do have to lean. We've never lost anybody. No, all you've got to do is replicate the body language yeah. of the driver. Well, if he's leaning, you're leaning. You're not, because he he is taking the bike into a, a pitch or or he's uh, cambering it, and you just go with it. It's yeah. as simple as that. I, I'm not at all certain about this yeah, method well, of travel at well, all. I think you've made a bit of a, a, no. a, 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 a booby here. No, uh, here's one all. from Warren in Bolton. He says, mm. when Porky's on the back of that bike, a taxi will look like a fat, giant koala bear when he's hugging the poor rider. Oh, really? Yeah. And who's that from? Uh, from Warren in Bolton. OK, Warren, stay in Bolton, pal. <laughs> because if I ever see you down here, huh. 
You'll be in trouble. Uh, uh, Mr Graham, did that Muppet Porky just say uh, that Mr Ford invented the first motor car? Mm. Is this the stupidest man on the radio? Well, he invented the Ford... Uh, what was the first Ford Chris car Chris in called? Tamworth. Was it the Ford A? A? Eh? The Ford it was a Model T, wasn't it? Model T, that was the one, the Ford yeah. Model T. But was it not actually the Daimler-Benz family that introduced the first motor car to the world? What I should have qualified it by saying is the first mass-produced motor car. Ah, yes, that okay. was the Model T. And you can have it in any colour as long as it's black. They're absolutely right. Yeah. And do you know what? That nearly... Uh, that nearly finished Ford off because what happened was he, he, he stuck by that Henry Ford, that mantra, any colour you like as long as in black. And yeah. then other, other companies like uh, Buick, Chrysler... Yeah. Uh, Buick was a great car. I used yeah, to love Buick. Yeah, Buick Chrysler. They came along and they started manufacturing cars in other colours. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it was it was a bit like um, you know, a bit like recent political ambitions mm. about having great leads in the market yeah. slashed to nothing. Right. Because the minute that they the competitors came along and said, "No, you can have a white car. Yeah. You can have a blue car. Yeah. You can have white wheels." Shocking. Uh, 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 Henry Ford uh, Junior. That's Henry Ford, the original founder's son. Said, "Dad, we've got to change." He said. We will never change. Yeah. We produce our cars in black. Mm. Eventually, the board, you know, of shareholders said, "You've got to change." Do you because... know, I've seen two very interesting cars of late. Oh yes. Uh, the other weekend, I saw a Rolls Royce, mm. uh, which was you know that two tone one that they yes. do, where the bonnet is silver and the uh, the the rest of the bodywork was, was red, was purple. Oh, purple, purple. because we saw a, a silver saw a with silver red body red, yeah. parked outside Torchport. Yeah, this one I saw was purple. That sounds lovely. Which was mm. well, weird looking. And then yes. the other one I've seen was yes. those, ba- those new Bentley sports cars. Yes. With just two doors, yeah. open top, in uh, gold. Wow. I that mean, sounds it just fantastic. It looked like it was about to be you know, pulled over by the cops. Fantastic. Being driven by some rap star. Absolutely right. Uh, now, there's a message here. the time, by the way. It says, the motorbike idea is part of Mr. Parry's reverie for yeah. San Francisco at the end of the 60s. Yeah. Easy Rider. Plank, do you remember, do you remember Easy the fil- Rider Plank, it says. Do you remember the film Easy Rider? That's from Jim, by the way. Yes. I loved it. I loved that film Easy Jim. Rider. That was me. I was All Captain right. America. I was going to get a hog. And you got shot in the end. I was going to get a hog, <laughs> and I was going to burn up and down Great Britain. You got just, shot. Just like uh, Peter. So what's his name? That was Jack Nicholson's uh, first sort of big movie. Um, what was he? What do you mean, what was he? I'll what? tell you later. We no, haven't got time Because for this. it was Dennis What's His Name and Peter. Dennis What's His Name and Peter. Yeah. 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 Do you mean Dennis Hopper? Dennis Hopper and, and Peter Fonda. And Peter Fonda. And they go. picked up Jack Nicholson, who oh, was a lawyer, who was a distressed lawyer, oh, yeah. who was drunk oh, and okay. in a prison cell. And they took him on their trip with them. Did they? And introduced him to marijuana. Ah. But we can't talk about that. It's a family show. This is yeah. Talk Sport. Yeah. Uh, got lots and lots of uh, tweets here. Here's, here's one uh, from Woody in Chelmsford. He says, yeah. The Model T Ford in its early years, 1908 to 1913, mm. was not available in black, but was in grey, green, blue and red. Mr. Parry, please get your facts right. I've got my facts right. Don't I'm worry. Sure, I'm sure that that quote is correct. Yes, of course it is. That you said you can have it in any colour as long as it's black. It's absolutely correct. And, mm. in fact, I've seen the documentary about uh, Ford and the production line... Um, only produce black cars, and he wouldn't change it. He yeah. said, "I wouldn't change it any, under any circumstances. Mm. It won't work. Nobody will buy one." And then Buick and Chrysler brought out coloured cars. Yes, and his son forced him to change. Otherwise, the co- the company was going bankrupt. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And we got some interesting info on Buick as well. But right yes. now, it's time to talk to Michael Cole, former royal reporter, of course, of the BBC, uh, former um, uh, associate of Mohammed Al Fayed. Yes, uh, he's been in the papers recently mm. uh, talking about a barn uh, which he's uh, uh, come to acquire on his land up in. Suffolk, where apparently uh, there are lots of witchcraft-like symbols on it, and we're going to find out precisely uh, what's going on. Is it a haunted house? Mm. Michael, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, Michael, and good afternoon, Michael. If you yes, have well, Michael's on the <laughs> on the air at the same time, it's a special prize. You think like three lemons on a on a fruit machine? Yeah, absolutely. The yeah. three Michael. It's not quite a jackpot, but no. you, something close. But Michael, very good you to join us. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm absolutely fascinated by this research you've done to these symbols in your barn. Where did this all start, Michael? Well, about thirty years ago, my wife and I bought a range of old barns and. Uh, cow sheds in the middle of a 70-acre field in the middle of Suffolk, Mm. and we started converting them as our home where we still live. We always knew that the oldest part of the buildings was a little barn that had been used for rearing calves, Mm. and it had a door in it about six feet by three made up of four large, wide deal planks. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a bit ragged at the bottom. We didn't have much money, so we, did, we kept it. And then eventually we replaced it and put a new door in. And what to do with the old door? Well, I did contemplate chopping it up for kindling wood, firewood. Mm. But I, something made me stop 
not doing that. And in the 70s, I had stripped a lot of uh, pine furniture and pine doors, and I thought, well, I know how to do this, and I'll just clean this door up. Mm. Now, there was about seven or eight coats of black paint and pitch on it, but eventually, as I cleaned away, suddenly uh, cryptic, mystic uh, signs started mm. to appear as I washed the paint away. Mm. And I thought, well, what on earth are these? Mm. If I can describe them to you briefly, they were what I now know are called hexafoils, round circles divided by six arcs, mm. which, if you look at them in a certain way, do depict a cross. Mm. And they look very much like the designs that children probably did on their school desks mm. using protractors, or there was that uh, product sold to kids in the 70s called a spirograph. I was mm. going to say, it looks a bit like a spirograph yeah. for yeah. creation, well, doesn't that's it? that's what I, I, of course, first thought it was. Yeah. But there are more and more and more of them, and some other mystic ones which aren't uh, these hexafoils. Yeah. We had a couple of uh, local Suffolk boys working at, a, at the house at the time, mm. and I asked them what they thought, and they took one look and said, that's witchcraft. Wow. And indeed, I found out, because fortunately there's a world authority on witch marks living very close to us, mm. that these are what are called apotropaic marks. Wow. Marks that are there to withstand or defend deter or guard you against evil and witchcraft mm. and this as i say this barn was for rearing calves and in those days people's fortune was tied up in their livestock and mm. if um calves died yep. or there was a lightning strike they feared that very much, and there were no, there were no uh, insurance companies offering them cover no. uh, uh, for their livestock. So they thought these uh, attacks came from witches. Mm. And in fact, there is some, uh, some authority for that, because in Shakespeare, um, Macbeth, he, he, the first witch in Macbeth says to the second witch, where hast thou been, sister? And the second witch replies, killing swine oh. and it was very much believed mm. that witches killed animals mm, there were I also see. people were very very scared yeah. of uh, lightning they thought that lightning was a supernatural thing yes. and after a lightning strike there was often a smell of a very pungent smell of mm. sulfur which of course was associated with hell and the devil yeah. and there was a belief that the devil had come calling mm. now i cleaned up this this um, yeah, door, door, and uh, I rather admired it. And people who are academics got to know about it. Mm. And now this little old door of ours from Suffolk is going to be a star exhibit in an exhibition next year mm. at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Now, wow. the Ashmolean is world famous. Yes, it's it the is. first museum established ever by a university. Mm. And they're holding an exhibition with a wonderful title, which is called spellbound, thinking wow. magically past and present, mm. and the director of the museum, he says this, which I think is something for your listeners mm. to ponder on, mm -hmm. spells, magical objects, and rituals are engines of hope, mm. and hope is essential to physical and mental health, indeed to survival. Mm. He goes on to say, we hope to reach people with this exhibition who recognize magic in this way, yet are unaware of how their own thoughts, words, actions might indeed constitute magical thinking. Mm. So there's the exhibition next year. Our mm. little old door is going to go along, uh, and you can go off to Oxford and see it. Or, Fantastic, Michael, well. you're always welcome up here. We, yes. we don't mind Everton fans up here. In <laughs> yes. I was going to say, I was gonna say Michael, a, a a, view. I was yeah, going to say, Michael, I was going to say, Michael, in a previous hmm. incarnation, hmm. Uh, you will no doubt have hosted Mr. Parry down at Craven Cottage when uh, when Mohammed <laughs> Al-Fayed was the owner. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping you can I've tell been, me that I've he was terrible. I full of supporters since I went with my dad at the age of 12. Yeah. So that is... 62 years, mm. and of course I was very proud, uh, my father was unfortunately not allowed to see it, I was very proud to, uh, to be a director of Indeed. Fulham for the, um, uh, the 16 years that yeah. Mr. Alfie had owned it, uh, mm. 13 of those I I in the um, Premier League. Mm. So uh, yeah, that's where we met, and um, 
yeah. uh, you in the in the company of all the elite uh, like Bill well, and others from absolutely. Everton. Absolutely, and in, in, in very much indeed, Michael. And and this um, this amazing discovery at your house and all that. We we've got a, a colleague, Alan Brazil. He lives in Suffolk. He's got a barn. I'm going to get him to start studying the though, well, we, well, we know Alan. He, I often I, we've met him at, at, at Newmarket. And he exactly. always gives me terrible tips whenever I go there. <laughs> yeah, that's, my I God, I know I'm in for a really bad day. Yeah, yeah. the only witch problem he's got, Michael, is which bottle to open next. I absolutely. think would be probably the fairest thing to say. Michael Cole, former Royal Reporter. Thank you very uh, much, Michael. Suffolk resident, of course. Uh, he's in a place called Saxmundum. Yeah, I know. I don't it's know whether you've ever been up there. Yeah, have, we'll yeah. talk about that later yeah, on. Yeah. Uh, coming up next, though, it's Porky Vision. <laughs> TV reviewer, I can reveal yeah. that there are no plans for a new series. Yeah, no, but it wasn't there a previous series. Oh, hang on, wait a minute, it says here there might be a new series. <laughs> What's the problem? Now, some people might be excited that it's the Queen's speech. Others yeah. might like, be looking forward to a day of rage. Yes. I, on the other hand, am much more excited about Porky Vision. Yes, indeed. Uh, which, of course, is that what music, uh, yeah. is, which is what that music uh, is signalling, is about to start. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of great TV on at the moment, oh, I have to say. great, brilliant. Uh, so what are you going to kick us off with? Well, I'm going to kick off with Poldark, OK? Because okay. Poldark's a plank. Now, I've always been a is big he? fan of Poldark. I love the old macho thing about galloping across yeah. the... taking his shirt off every yeah, five minutes. Yeah, galloping across the Cornish uh, cliffs and all that kind yeah. of stuff, you know. But he's a complete plank because he's so much of a do-gooder. <laughs> yeah. He's become irrelevant to yeah. me. What is his third series now, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's the third series, but I'm, I'm telling you, you know, I don't like... I, I like people who help the rest, but I don't like do-gooder, yeah. do-gooders. Right. So guess what he's done? What's he doing now? Because well, well, he was saving, like, the tin yeah. mines the last yeah, time we well, found he, out. Well, he's got through all that now. He saved the tin mines, got people in work. He's yeah. now become reasonably wealthy and uh, the Wallagodens or whatever they're called the, um, the the family that he rivals oh, you right, know okay. uh, Walladens or the Wallagodens Wall- or something Walladens, yeah. well it's some Cornish name okay. uh, they're in fierce competition with him but right. he's doing alright mm. and to the extent where the county sheriff, who's got an even bigger house than the Walla Goddens, right. who are the second wealthiest family yeah. in Cornwall. Right. And Sounds Pol- like a tribe. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and Poldock's now the third, OK? Yeah. And so so the guy who's the county, uh, you know, sheriff... Yeah. Uh, what, is that the county sheriff? County the, sheriff, I The guess, guy who represents know. the Queen in the county. You know, yes. The, uh, yes, I know yeah. who you mean. Yeah, this, I might have another name. Yeah, something like yeah. that. He, uh, he has a big bash, and uh, old... Um, Oh, I think his name is Rofe or something. The Rofe. Wa- the Wallagodden guy who right. is uh, nasty. Rofe Wallagodden. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, nasty bit of stuff. You know, always trying to sort of. Uh, in fact, he tried to get uh, Paul Dark jailed Did on he? trumped up charges yeah. and all that. Right, okay. So the county sheriff invites yeah. them all to a party, mm. and Paul Dark's invited upstairs for a drink with the sheriff. Oh, you know, yeah. a big one, big yeah. stiff drink. Uh-huh. And the sheriff says, um, "I want you to be the new magistrate. One of the magistrates has uh, retired; uh-huh. he's too old now. Right. And I want you to sit on the bench." Okay. So Does he have to have some qualification for that? No, because magistrates don't do they? Magistrates are yeah. of the people, aren't okay. they? You know. Right. So, so this is an absolute gift in his hands, Paul Dark, where he can sort out the Walla Godden guy. You know, by issuing new laws oh, and all yeah. this kind of stuff, right. make sure that Walla Godden isn't going around, you know, beastly, you know, being beastly to yes. his people and workers and all that uh-huh. kind of stuff, right. and then drag him into line. So guess what he says? He says no. He says I wasn't put on earth to legislate over my fellow man. Yes. So guess what? What does he do? So he walks out of the house. Guess who the, who the sheriff gives the job to? Who? Rolf Walla Godden. What? Who's now making up plans, you know, to destroy Poldark's <laughs> business, to jail all his people. So he's to... made a bit of an idiot of himself. Well, then. he's a complete. Clown. Right. I, mean, I mean, you know, I, I could tell from a mile off. Well, if you don't take it, then give it to your enemy. Yes. So, you know, complete plan. He seems to have a lot of enemies as well, got, Paul. Doc, doesn't well, he? well, he's a he's a do gooder, and do gooders always come a cropper in the end. Now then, the other great um, uh, one is Riviera. Utterly brilliant. Oh yes. This is with our, our favourite actress, Julia Stiles. Julia Stiles, and I tell you, it is, it, it's made by Sky, right? It's, it's spectacular in its lavishness. Right. Unbelievable. It looks, the, the trailers all look terrific. Oh, they're absolutely fantastic. Say. So, of course, as you can imagine, it's all about people who live on boats yeah. uh, off Monaco, right. you know what I mean? And is it all shot on location down all south All shot on location, uh, unbelievably good, you know? Right. So, uh, I watched the first episode twice. It was so good that I didn't want to go on to the second episode before I fully understood the plot in the yeah. first. You see what I mean? Yes. And this uh, Julia Stiles, her character, has married mm. a billionaire, right. uh, but only a year ago. OK. You know, and she was formerly his mistress and all that kind of stuff. Oh, was he married to someone else then? Yeah, obviously, yeah. Well, sorry, it's not obvious to me. Well, it I've is. If you're the mistress, it. then you've got to have a wife, haven't you? Well, you so, say that. I just was checking. So, anyway, he's. Uh, this is all, you know, real high-powered stuff. He's on the boat having a bit of a party. 
And she flies off in a single private plane, like oh, yeah. the jet that we uh, shared with the... Well, we got onto Rod Stewart's jet. It's a plane exactly the similar. <laughs> Let's get that into Porky Vision. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well done. It's exactly the same sort of plane. Okay. And, and she's sent to a New Lear York. Jet. A Learjet, mm. actually, yeah, you're right. Mm. And she's sent to New York to go to an art auction and buy a painting for $30 million. $30 million? Mm. Why not? So she's sitting in the... She's actually sitting in the um, in the auction, yeah. and she's phoning her husband and saying, it's up to 30 how much can I go to? Mm. How much can I go to? Mm. He gets distracted by a young girl on the yacht he's on, oh, yeah. but he hasn't told his wife he's on a yacht. Ah. He's told his wife he's on land oh, see. at an apartment, yes. OK? right. So... Anyway, the young girl he's interested in, for some bizarre reason, then dives off the eighth deck of the yacht ah. into the into the water right. off the south of France. And she must know something, I think, because I'm putting the plot together, because about three minutes later, the the yacht blows up. Wow. It, it, I mean, it, the whole thing, it's yeah. like been hit by a missile, yeah. you know what I mean? Right. So he's reduced to literally a crispy uh, bit of ash. You know, uh, he looks like... Um, but isn't in the trailer, isn't there a body of a dead man lying on a rock? Isn't no, it's a woman. That's the woman who died oh. off the boat. Oh, that's not him. No, 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 no. Oh, right. So, uh, so uh, anyway, she's flying back from America. She can't understand why her husband didn't finish the auction with her and they lost the painting. Right. So she's a bit, you know, disappointed about doesn't that. Doesn't she slightly, slightly worried that she can't get hold of him on the phone? No, because when she's in the air... You, you know, you, you, oh, you right, can't okay. always on a mobile phone or whatever. Mm. She lands in France to be met by, you know, one of his top assistants to say he is literally a fried crisp because although the boat blew up, they did recover his body, but it right. wasn't pleasant, no. you know what I mean? No, I'm sure. Um, so her life has couldn't be changed uh, 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 amazingly. But then, of course, as always happens with these billionaires, she finds out in his death from the very unhelpful ex-wife yes. that she's replaced, oh, right? Dear. That, oh, well, you knew, of course, that he had a love nest, don't you? And, you know, so-and-so. Oh, no, I didn't, know. Yeah. So she goes along there. So the, so the first wife knew everything. The first wife knew everything. Yeah. And uh, and he had this pied de terre, you know. Pied de terre, yeah. yeah. pied de terre, where yeah. he's, you know, obviously using it for horizontal refreshment yes. on a regular basis. Which Family show. his wife. Family yeah. show, yeah. And she gets in there, and, uh, and where it stops mm. is... Um, she finds a gun in a, in a, in a you're not drawer. You're going to tell us the whole plot, are you? Eh? Hey? You're not going to tell well, us the whole well, plot. Well, she picks a gun out, well, right? People might not want to know exactly what happens. Well, I don't know you're what just, happened well, because at the end of the first... Well, you're just supposed to tell everybody how she good t- it is. She takes the gun out. Or bad. Some guy comes into the, into the apartment. We don't know who it is. She yeah. points the gun and says, that was not an accident. Which is, you know, she's worked that out. Great piece of acting. Meanwhile, the girl, the girl, yeah, that's right. The girl who jumped off the, the time, by the way. Who died, no, don't worry about the time. Have you got the else to talk girl, about. Yeah, yeah. The girl who dived off the yacht is washed up on rocks. I see. You know, but she's still alive. She's still alive. Yeah, she's still oh, alive. Right, okay. So somebody's broken into the hospital to try and kill her because she knows too much. Blimey. Okay. So there's something going it's all on. happening. Now, now the other one I'll tell you about is the lock. Yes. Okay. I watched that actually. Yeah, it's a bit. I quite liked it. Uh, it is, but it's a real takeoff of uh, um, what's the uh, uh, beachhead, Broadchurch. Broadchurch. It's a real takeoff of Broadchurch. Well, it's done by the same TV company, isn't it's it? It's by the same TV company. It's a Scottish version of Broadchurch. Yeah. And it involves, again, a very tough cop, but the tough cop is a woman. Yeah. And she's a Northern English woman. Mm. And she's dynamic in the way she puts everybody down. Yes. You know, you know, the. She is. I don't like her, actually. Yeah. Well, you're not supposed to. You're yeah. supposed to like her. She's mm. a, you know, she's a, she's a cop with a nasty edge to her. Yes. But she, you know, she, she's made sure that she, all the witnesses know you're a suspect. Yeah. She's made sure that all the colleagues around her, all the cops know that, you know, she is going to be in charge of the investigation. The one flaw in the whole plot yeah. is she turns up with a criminal psychologist. Yeah. And I've seen this actor before. He's a very good actor. He's played a policeman himself in right. the past, you know. Uh-huh. But I know for a fact, because I know these things, mm. no criminal psychologist has ever You've solved mentioned this before, a case. Yeah. He's never. You know, you know, they became famous after the fat guy did... Uh, cracker. Uh, cracker, that's yeah. right, yeah, yeah. And and so they became very famous mm. then. Oh, criminal psychologists, yeah, yeah. they solve cases. Right. They don't. They've never solved really? a case. And this guy strolls in and starts ordering all these top detectives yeah. around, go here, go there, this has happened, this is the guy we're looking for. So that's a bit of a rubbishy part of the plot, yeah. but the, the, the actress who plays the, the lead cop is yeah. so good, yeah. so good. It takes everything else I like Laura and, Fraser's good as well. L- who? Laura Fraser, the, uh, the Scottish woman with the sort of dark Scottish hair. Scottish woman, the dark hair, she He's brilliant as well. Yeah. And I have to say that the, the backdrop to it, Loch Ness. Yeah, I'm not sure what if it is Loch Ness, you know. No, I, it is. I, I was looking at it. I'm not sure it is. No, it is Loch Ness. Is I'm it? not sure it is. They keep referring to the monster. Yeah, in, in, but they don't in, call it Loch Ness, though, do they? Well, they don't because right. they want you know they want it to go abroad and people to be mysteriously wondering <laughs> what part of Scotland it is and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? 
I know what you're laughing at. Well, and, that, uh, that's right. And uh, and and Same and the time, by the way. Yeah, and the other thing is that you know it's it, like Broadchurch. Yeah. It's got a load of disturbed children yeah, yeah. whose parents are having it away with each other, yeah. and they're all very worried. Sure. And you know, everybody inevitably. Yeah, you know, going to get anorexic in the end and all that kind of stuff. Really? You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's my that's my. Uh, that's your take on it. That's well, my thank you very on. much yeah. indeed. Unfortunately, okay. we're out of time. Yeah, okay. So it's we can't good, though, upset it? any it's more good. people. It's good. It's very full of information. Describing. Thank you very much indeed. That was Porky Vision. That was Porky Vision. Uh, same again yeah. next time, yeah. uh, same time next week. That's right, top quality. This is the two mics on TalkSport with Wix. Save 35% on selected lawn mowers like the Flymo 37 centimetre electric lawn mower was 79.99. Now, just 49.99. People are still trying to work out what your PIN number is, by the way. Tubby yeah. Tyke in Wakefield says yes. this. I guess Porky's birthday is the 7th of May, mm. and that would make his PIN 7557. Nowhere close, I'm afraid, mm. honestly. That's Nowhere not your near. birthday anyway, is it? No, it's not. It's 20, my, my birthday is on the 29th of December. Yeah. Gary says, uh, have you got the? Have you seen the time set as a jingle? Mm. You say it enough, uh, so it might be yeah. worth doing. Yeah. Funnily enough, and yeah. I must find out about this, actually, because yes. I don't know what happened to it. We were in the process a little while ago... Mm. Uh, of setting up some ringtones. Yes, were we, we are. not? Well, I think they have been set up. I they? think they have. They but, are being I mean, set up. But I, yeah. but, I mean, I thought they should have been set up by yeah. now. Yeah. What has been set up, however, finally, yes. is the ticket line for our uh, New York concert That's right. show, which is at the City Winery uh, mm. on Saturday, the 16th of September. Yeah. And um, we should tell people to go to uh, either the City Winery website yes. to check it out. Go to the Two Mics website as well, twomikes.co.uk, yes. where you can find yes. uh, lots of uh, uh, links and things. Because That's not right. only can you buy tickets to mm. go to the show, mm. if you can't make it to mm. Manhattan mm. in September, That's right. uh, you can stream it live into your living room uh, or your bedroom yeah. or your bathroom, just, wherever you want to do just it. Just like any other pay-per-view product. Just like product. any other pay-per-view product. And yeah. it's only about five ninety nine. Uh, is it five ninety nine? So a lot yeah. cheaper than uh, the Mayweather-McGregor, I can tell you I that. I totally agree. And keep an eye on our Twitter accounts, because I will be putting out a regular link that takes you straight to, you? Um, straight to the Top City man. Winery. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. One thing we've got to say is that um, when we've been negotiating the date for this, there was an original thought it would be on the Sunday. Yeah. But that has had to take a bit of negotiation, because this place does actually... Uh, cater for some very big people in the showbiz world. Suzanne Vega. Suzanne Vega. Has got it on Sunday. Uh, has got it on Sunday. We thought that we My could... My name is Luca. That's right. We thought that we'd be able to do it on the same day, but yeah. they're all, you know, they're, they're, their operation is so big. Art Garfunkel's played there as well. Art Garfunkel has played there. Jackson Brown. Jackson Brown. So we're doing it the day before. Yeah. So uh, we're all looking forward to seeing anybody who, who gets out there to see it. Yep. And a lot of expats out there would express the uh, will to want to come down to New York and see Yes. For the rest of you, as I say, it's on streaming. We're it's very excited great. about it's it. It's going to be very exciting and, indeed. Uh, we're, you know, we're, we're delighted. Jim to be says this: Walligan disappointingly straightforward compared to Mr. Parry's pronunciation. Yes, um, is it Wallington? Uh, Wall- 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 he Wall- says Walligan. I don't know. Walligan. Yeah, it could be Walligan. Yeah, Jerry right. says, please end Porky Vision now. Right. He's still rambling about Poldark, and yet after three minutes of listening, yeah. I'm still none the wiser. Well, you should be. You should have listened more carefully, shouldn't you? And uh, by the way, it's no good people saying to me, oh, don't tell us the plot. Porky Vision is about what's happened on television. If you've stored it on your Skybox or something like that, I can't be responsible for that, pal. Mm. Or pals. <laughs> or, pals. Or Janet says, I knew Porky would rave about mm. Riviera. Mm. And then she's suggesting that that makes you not a man of the people. I'm a man of the people. Because you're impressed with people but... with private jets and yachts and all that sort of thing. Well, uh, of course you're impressed with people with yachts. It means that their life's winners. And I'd rather be in the, you know, the compound which says winners than in the compound that says losers, because I don't know about losing, so yes. I'm not used to being there, am I? No, indeed. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, we've got uh, a couple of other things to say. Yes. Uh, we are, of course, the two mics on TalkSport. We are with Wix, and every day we give away a £100 Wix gift card mm. to the best caller. Today's winner, uh, we think, should be um, Janine, right? Janine, definitely. Mm. The lady caller who uh, made a great contribution to the show, thank you very much indeed, rang up to support Andy Murray after he crashed out of Queen's and therefore siding with my rather intellectual and informed view of what's going on. Janine, you are truly a great listener to talk sport. Mm. Wayne says, people are thinking as Porky's pin is two numbers. Mm. Uh, I bet it's the same number four times. That's mm. how simple he is. I can't say is anything. Is it the same number four times? I'm sorry, I can't say anything. Well, you can always try that. 
I just can't Because, I mean, actually, the same number four times, mm. you'd only have to try it nine times, wouldn't you? Well, Ten I suppose times. so. Well, I mean, I'm not telling anybody because this is getting foolish and all this kind of stuff. I think you better change it, to be honest. Uh, well, you know... It's, Do you I'd use the same pin on all the same, all your cards, or have they all got different ones? They've all got different ones. Have they? Yeah, because, um, you know, years ago, you didn't have that many pins, and so you would just uh, pick one and have it for... Um, the, the years ago as well, when you got a new card, you had to change the pin anyway. I yeah. remember. Yeah, but now you can, you know. I you just know. keep the same pin. Yeah, I mean, so many numbers you've got to remember. Same these with days. passwords and things. Yeah, it's, I, I, I it's don't know of the it? passwords that I've got. I really don't. Yeah. And I'm always guessing because when I used to have, um, you know, to transfer stuff from like one laptop to another, yeah. they'd always say, what you. And I knew it was either Alan Ball or <laughs> Alan Ball 8. Or eight Alan Ball, really? or Alan Ballio eight because somebody. Why else are you had giving Alan it Ball away? Eight. Well, I'm not because it, well, doesn't, you are. it doesn't exist anymore. You don't they, use that anymore. No, they're all gone. Yeah, they're all gone. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's what I used to do, but so I don't do it anymore. What have you turned them all into now then? Oh, uh, I've got a guy now who sets it all up for me, and he he puts them into hieroglyphics. You know, like X Y, you know, T twenty four seven minus. Plus, and all that kind of stuff, you know what I mean? We've got one here from uh, Stuart, yeah. who says, yeah. that girl that died, who was washed up on the rocks, is yeah. still alive. Yeah, she's Hashtag still alive. Hashtag plank. I said that. I said well, to you, didn't Well, she didn't die I? then, did she? I said to you that she's still alive. Well, she she's died in the hospital, then. And then some guy broke into the hospital, some assassin, trying to kill her. I see. Uh, and by the way, the cop was a plank. The French cop who chased him out of the hospital uh, wasn't bright enough to work out which way he turned when he came out of the hospital. So he lost him. So that's another assassin still on the loose. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ali has sent us a picture uh, where he's got, uh, got us done up as the... Uh, I've actually, I'm not sure if he's actually had us done up or whether it's the two fat ladies. Is it two fat ladies on a motorbike and a sidecar? Oh, yeah, that's brilliant. I love that, yeah. If we the, one, can... the one who's actually on the bike looks exactly like me. Yes, that's right. And... But he hasn't actually changed the face to make it me. It's no. Just, it's just that we, we share a certain resemblance. That's right. But you see, the problem is, is that that wouldn't be any good, a, a motorbike and a sidecar, because that's the same width as a car. We need a motorbike uh, taxi yeah. so they can weave through the traffic. Yeah, I'm still not sure about this. Well, there's no other way of doing it, pal, unless well, you want to hire your uh, private helicopter. No, I don't want to do that either. Yeah. Uh, and, now, and even then, you'd have to climb up a, you know, a rope ladder into the <laughs> chopper above Sky Why HQ. would you have to do that? Well, because there's nowhere for it to land. Of course there is. There isn't. Where? Well, you're telling me they can't land a chopper at Sky. They've got a Sky chopper. Uh, what yeah. they have? So yeah. They must have somewhere to, to land it. The Sky Chopper is not based at Sky. It's, oh. it's based at a... I uh, can't believe they haven't got somewhere a, to it's, land it's it. It's based at a, a helidrome, isn't it? It's um, Heli Battersea. The Battersea. I, Maybe. Bet, I bet you. I don't Maybe. know. Maybe. I don't know. It may be. It anyway, may be. listen. What about the Porky quiz? Because that's on Friday. Tomorrow we're going to do Ask Porky. Yes. So if you've got any questions that you need answers to, you know what to do. OK. Hashtag now, it Ask Porky. Yeah. And we'll put it out uh, uh, on uh, on Twitter, Twitter now, and Facebook a little bit later. That's right. Now, you know we had the other Jim White in the studio this week. We did He's indeed. a book on the George Jim White Best. from the Daily Telegraph. That's yeah. right. Jim White. Yeah. Telegraph. And you know that, of course, it is June uh, 2017. Right. And Manchester United won the European Cup in May yeah. 1968. 1968. So what's that got to do with June 2017? Well, it's uh, it's many years <laughs> on, and I thought to celebrate the fact that they won it all what's those years ago. What's the anniversary, then? Uh, well, if it was 67 it, to 17, yeah. it would be 50 years. Uh-huh. Wouldn't it be 70? Eh? Wouldn't it be 70 years? No, 67 to 17 is yeah. 50 years, is isn't it? it? Is it? You well, sure? work it out in your head. 67, 77, 87, 97, 2007, yeah, it's 50 years. Thank you. Yeah. So we are... So it's, it's one uh, less, It's 49 it? years, yeah. so we're doing it in advance. What? Uh, one year in advance. Doing what? A quiz on, on George what? Best. Oh, George Best. On George Best, Okay, yes, yes. I didn't know it was decided. Yes, it's okay. we're doing it on George Best. So we're doing Best, it on yeah. George Best. Yeah, who's okay. a, a legendary figure, and it won't just be Manchester United fans, it'll be Irish fans. Ireland, yeah. It will well, he be... played for uh, QPR, as we heard. No, he didn't, actually. He played for Fulham. I thought he said uh, yesterday that Tommy no. Doherty brought him back to play for QPR. No, Jim White said Tommy Doherty brought him back to play against QPR. Oh, against that's, QPR. Where, that's where Jim White saw him oh, at Loftus Road, and yes. he said he was, a, you know, he was a, a finished footballer Shadow of by his that time. Self. He yeah. played in America as well, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He played with Alan Brazil in America. Did Al, he? Al went over to um, Detroit, uh-huh. and, uh, and, and and by the way, to come on the pitch in Detroit, you're yeah. coming on sitting on the top of a car. Really? Yeah, yeah, oh, dear. Yeah, played we're out of time, there. unfortunately. Yeah, we are. So uh, that will be the quiz. George Best on Friday. This is TalkSport. Don't forget to follow the two mics at the two mics on Twitter and on YouTube. Just look for Two Mics TV.